Don't mess with me, I'm one crazy mofo. Don't mess with me, I'm one crazy loser. Excellent friends, welcome in to the very first episode of Fixers, Fixers Heavy Metal History. As we have set the booth to go back in time to the late 18th century in the Kingdom of France. So, here we are, France. Around... 1750s, we're going to pick up the story today, but we're going to go into a lot more detail behind that. I appreciate everyone being here. Um, the maps are old, and they are what they are. Um, I cannot get the contrast to be any better. I have uh, kind of spot-checked some of them, and there's a lot of maps. You see a bunch of tabs across the top. We're going to go through all that. So, before we get going tonight, um, first of all, I've set the highlight my message channel point reward to 10 points, which is the lowest I can set it. If you have a question, that's the absolute best way to get me to eyeball chat because I am going to be eyeballing notes. So if you want to ask a question, um, highlight it. If I miss, uh, I would ask the mod to at me and get my attention or fixer me and get my attention. Yep, that's his full name. We'll get there. He's actually got a tab open right now, agree. But first, um, we're going to talk about a couple things that are misnomers, things that people perceive about the French Revolution, especially in United States history perspective, and why those are wrong. Let's start with the first one. It's in the opening credits. Queen Marie Antoinette did not say, let them eat cake. There is absolutely no place in any historical reference that says the queen said, let them eat cake. She was aloof. She was disconnected. She was um, not in touch with the problems of her people, but... Nowhere ever does anyone document that that was said by her. There's absolutely no attributable source that says she said it. The second thing is that American history teaches that the American Revolution was the great domino, right? Um, we go back to hearing about the shot heard around the world at Lexington and Concord that started the great cavalcade of revolution around the world. And that's not true. The American Revolution was a tax revolt that the members of the Continental Congress kind of backed into. They they just wanted fair play from England and then realized, oh crap, we probably are going for independence here, huh? But what is not true is that in 1775, when those first shots were fired in Massachusetts, that that somehow awoken the world to the fact that they were being oppressed. The dominoes that we're gonna go over throughout this series, and especially tonight, that set up why France revolted, have their roots well before anything happened in America. The American Revolution certainly contributed to the French Revolution, especially economically. But it, had, it hurts to breathe. It, had, it did not have that one domino struck another, like France noticed that America revolted and said we should do that too, because that's not accurate either. So, it's going to be difficult for me to look at chat, look at notes, look at the camera. I'm gonna do my best. I am glad your plans got canceled, Gree. I'm happy to see you here. Really welcome in. Um, I do have to remember to, uh, next week to put the 
layer that shows the shoutouts behind the opening credits. <laughs> Other than that, things are great. Okay, so let's talk about the grand Marxist theory. And, and for people that don't understand Mar what Marxism means, Karl Marx was the was a philosopher, economic, uh, economist that came along after the French Revolution. And it started a movement with, uh, with Engels and others to where the idea of class versus class, structured warfare economically and politically were the reasons for revolution. And if you take Marxist theory and look at the French Revolution, you can, you can see that. You can, you can look from a very, very high angle and go, yeah, that's, that's definitely something where the poor people rose up against the nobility or the aristocracy, and it, but that's not what happened. It's far more nuanced than that. There were upper middle class people. The alerts and earlier music are also considerably louder than your voice. Thank you very much. I will turn my voice up. Um, but it's not about commoners versus nobles or commoners versus the king. It is a, it's, it's more nuanced than that because there were upper class commoners, which are called the bourgeoisie, who were buying into the nobility, who didn't want a revolution. So to take the idea of these commoners as a complete group rising up and revolting against the crown is far too coarse of a view of things. So we're gonna cover four topics tonight. The four topics are gonna to be listed as always in the notebook so you can kind of keep track of where we are if you come in the middle or you have to step away um but we're going to cover four things the three estates brief history of the french bourbon dynasty the ancien regime and the french enlightenment the french enlightenment is going to help us swing into talking about the controllers general who were in charge of france's finances and the actual dominoes that started to fall next week so that's the other thing, the ancien regime. Um, I took French 30 years ago and it's rusty. I'm gonna do my best with some specific pieces of information um, to pronounce them in as much Americanized Fran French as I can. And then there are certain things like the, the city of Reims here in, Norm in Brittany that there's no way I can't pronounce it in French. My mouth doesn't make the sound. Bourgeoisie for people that need the spelling, yes. And then one last thing, uh, there will be a test. Um, a test for free packs of, of cards at the end of the, the uh, episode tonight as we kind of close things down and my voice is giving out on me i will ask questions um don't say si say oui je do but um i will be asking questions those who get it right first in the firebot chat the first person i see in my firebot chat get a question right gets a free pack of cards so that's your incentive to pay attention the whole time because it won't be an easy question so let's knock out some geography things real quick this is france you can see this blue border running along right here. This is France in 1789. This is where Paris is, right here where I'm circling with my cursor. So as you're forming the notion of where things are geographically, Paris is pretty far north in France. Brittany, Dauphine, Provence, these are all places I'm going to refer to quite a bit. Also, especially the city of Toulon, when we get to talking about Napoleon in 1793, when he starts to come onto the scene. Um, and also very early down here, this region in the Pyrenees called Navarre. No more school. Uh, too bad, it's the wrong channel for you then. So let's start talking about these things that I said are called the three estates. So for those of you that know your history, you'll know that in the Middle Ages, before the Renaissance, um, the large political structure in Europe was the feudal system, where it was a caste-based system, where there were you know, kings and lords and nobles, and they were the lords. And then there was a commoner class called the serfs. And the serfs were tied to their land, meaning they couldn't move. Like, you enjoy the freedom to move about wherever you want, generally in the free Western world and most of the free Eastern world, you can pick up, pack up your car, load up your U-Haul, and drive wherever you want. Your labor moves with you. Serfs could not do that. Serfs could be killed for doing that. And the notion of serfs and lords directly becomes the three estates. The three estates are broken into three different groups. The first estate is those who pray. That would be the clergy, from every common priest to every bishop and archbishop in, in France. 
The second estate is the aristocracy, the lords, the nobles, those who fight in the traditional feudal war sense. And then everybody else is the third estate, those who work. So in 1789 in France, there were about 27 million French people. And it's important to get that concept in your head because the American Revolution and the, the English Revolution and the English Civil War a century before it deal in millions of people. The French Revolution deals in tens of millions of people and soon much, much more than that. But it's an order of magnitude of increase with respect to how many people are involved. So the American Revolution had armies fighting that numbered in the thousand and you will get to the french revolution when as we get into the war side of things where your armies are in the tens to hundreds of thousands and that is a big deal with respect to the whole concept of why i wanted to do this series where you go from talking about wars between groups of thousands into wars of groups of millions and how do we get there that's how we get there is starts here so the third estate was about 95% of the French population. And they can be break, broke down into a bunch of different groups. Um, we'll start with the poorest people, the landless agri you know, agrarian rural peasants. Uh, they were day laborers. They picked up to do migrant farm labor. They moved around and they would go from farm to farm to farm to farm in France just doing work. And the rural peasants in France made up about four-fifths of the population. So of the 27 million people who lived in France in 1789, 80% of them are rural workers in some form or another. That's the rural peasants who I just talked about. And then there's the ones who owned the land or leased a small plot of land from someone who owned it. So they didn't move around. They, they farmed very small farms. And French agriculture in the 18th century is super backwards. And economically, politically, there's a lot, and we're going to get on all that in a little bit. But the agricultural cultural setup of France was just broken, where you had individual pockets of labor that were not coordinating in any sort of fashion, producing barely enough to sustain themselves, and maybe every once in a while have enough to go to market. And that's where these small plot owners, I lease a plot of land from someone else farmers live. And these guys wanted to eventually become the next group of rural, rural farmers, which are the independent farmers. I own a big piece of land. I make enough to employ the landless peasants, and I have enough land to potentially lease a piece to these small plot farmers. Um, they provide the bulk of the work. Oh, hey, Jax. They provide the bulk of the work in rural France, to everybody else, these large plot owners. You can actually take that a little bit back if you're familiar with Roman history to the way in which near the end of the Republic, large farming estates started to become the norm where consolidation of land into large farms became a way for nobles to become rich, but it also became more efficient. So these, these, Raids of the party of three. Thank you very much. So these independent, larger plot-owning farmers, who were still commoners, they they would also try to gobble up the small plots. Like if they saw somebody who was a small plot farmer that couldn't make it, they would try to pick up that land, and then they'd lease that land back out. But they wanted to be the owner. That's the spice. What's up? We're talking about the French Revolution. Welcome in. Welcome to the big map of France. That's going to be in front of you for quite a while. So that's kind of the, the general idea of distribution of people in the rural sector of the third estate. Again, the commoners in France in 1789. Again, it's landless peasants, just migrant day agricultural laborers. Those who were really small farmers kind of trying to step their way up or just barely make it. And then those who were independent. I have enough money. I'm going to make it. I, I produce enough wheat or grapes or barley to go to market, make a profit. I employ other people. And I'm always looking to buy up another piece of land to increase my holdings. So, again, that's four-fifth. Four-fifth of 27 million people is this group of agricultural workers. So we've taken 80% of the people in France generally and just said, here they go, they're in this bucket, right? And we'll start, we'll, we will pivot from that into 
the urban common classes of people. So you start off with most cities, and we talk about cities, we're talking about Reims, we're talking about Orleans, we're talking about Toulon. They had like 2,000 people in them. My hometown when I grew up had about 2,000 people in it, and it was not a big city. So you have to take in your brain and realize that when we say cities in 18th century France, we are talking about a scale back from what your brain thinks big city. 2,000, 4,000 people in most of these dots on this map right now is the, popula the entire population of the town, not just the third estate commoners of that town, but all the people in that town. The big exceptions being a city like Paris, which had like 650,000 people crammed into it. So you have these... Major urban centers, there are only a couple of them. Most of the cities and towns are really small. And then Paris is a barrel crammed to the gills with people looking for a chance at anything. 650,000 people compared to most towns on the, you know, maybe four to five figure range. Paris is huge in terms of how many common people live in it. And that's exceedingly important as we begin to talk about in a couple of episodes why the mob the audience the everyday people who finally wake up and say hey there's a lot of us and not a lot of them and we should probably do something having that scale in your head that yeah paris is chock full of people most of them third estate commoners and I'm going to say third estate commoners for a while until third estate rings commoner in everyone's head. But chock full of third estate commoners. The mob. Yeah, Green knows where it goes. Also, if you're a student of history, I would ask that you stay in the moment we're in. Um, don't lead the group that is unfamiliar too much because it's like spoiling a story. And my intent here, once this foundation is laid, is to tell a story. History can be dense and really hard to sink your teeth into because it comes at you from independent authorities who have their own agendas and it's hard to piece together what is what. So I would hope that you would bear with me and as we open a door and turn a page and take a step and you're going, oh, I know this, feel free to go at it. But until we get there, think of it like a spoiler. You don't want to spoil the story for everybody else, right? Okay, so we're going to go from the rural third estate into the urban third estate. So there, Again, 650,000 people in Paris. The first group kind of matches what was in the rural areas. Unskilled laborers, people who didn't, know how, didn't have a trade. They weren't trained in a job. They were the people who woke up from the gutter every day and went and found what work they could do. Um, you're talking about people who did seasonal work. No, you're not, you're not bad at all, Gree. I mentioned the mob. I, you just gave me a, a place to speak to it, that I, I didn't need to mention it. You're, you didn't do anything wrong. So the unskilled labor was exactly who you think it is. People like, um, deliver, that could deliver things from place to place if you could read a map or just follow Excellent. Or oral instructions. But the unskilled laborers were seasonal laborers. They would come in from... The rural side of the country in the winter when there was no harvest and they still needed work to make you know to buy bread and to buy wood to heat wherever they were living and they would do servant work so people who needed um servants in their homes um would hire unskilled labor because being a servant like carrying a basket of this from there to there in someone's home is not a skilled job um they would do day labor and there would be temporary works projects all over cities that you know rebuilding a church steeple or a new a new water you know a new water basin or repairing walls and this is still a time in history where cities are walled where they are surrounded by walls and france and paris is especially one of those cities uh, the idea of the army marching on your walls and laying siege to that city and you not needing walls to defend it has not gone away yet so most of these larger cities in france and then in europe are going to be walled with major gates that are defended. But these unskilled laborers would just, they would do whatever work they could find. They didn't have a skill. Um, it's 
it's kind of like those people, and I hate to make this analogy, but I, people who apply for a minimum wage job today, most minimum wage jobs, many of them are either low skill or no skill, and they're jobs that anyone can put their foot in the door to and begin to make regular income from. It's that type of work that an unskilled laborer in France, in urban France in the 1780s would be doing. Then you step into skilled labor. Skilled labor is people like blacksmith, bookbinder, cobblers, weavers, people who were part of the guild system. And the guild system is this anachronistic haberdashers. There you go, that's another good word. It's a, it's, the guild system is this archaic relic structure in Europe. Shrubbers. That's also a good one. <laughs> but the guild system is this archaic structure, right? Where you apprentice under someone for seven years because they said so, and then you become a journeyman. And journeymen would travel around and ply their trade all over the, the country. And they would actually get into physical altercations with other journeymen. It was kind of like a like a little mini war of competition within the trade. And then after a period of time, as the journeymen had been around and established their trade, they became a master. And the master could set up a shop and take on apprentices. And it was this closed circle, right? This closed economic engine circle where you had to be a participant. And the greatest example of this is the Freemasons. The Freemasons have developed into a secret society in our modern interpretation. But back in the day, stoneworkers were stoneworkers, and that's not, that was a skilled job. So the idea that you had to buy in to the system because you kind of had to pay to be an apprentice and then participate as a grunt for a master who had done his time and didn't want to do the hard work anymore, wanted to have an apprentice or even maybe a journeyman working for them so that there was the, their name over the shop door, but all the peons were doing the job. Sound a lot like maybe American corporate culture these days because it's very much like the old guild system except you don't have to pay to get your initial job. Including Roger the Shrubber, indeed. But the guild system was this thing that was a barrier to the evolution of the modern, at the time, the modern economic development of Europe. Because Europe as a whole in the late 18th century was moving to a free economy, a free trade economy, the same economy that this modern world fights for. We want no internal barriers to trade. We want to have limited external barriers to protect our national trade. Those concepts of free trade are directly in opposition to the guild system. So it's kind of funny that the guild system parallels so well to the corporate system in so many ways. So the whole idea here is that you have these unskilled laborers, laborers and these skilled laborers, but they were the grunt of the commoners. They were the everyday dirt on their face, fingernails had dirt underneath them, calloused hands, hard workers. And they make up a group, a very important group. And this is where I'll say, does anybody know the term for the group that the unskilled and skilled urban laborers in France around the time of the revolution make up? If you don't know, that's fine, because I'm going to tell you. So going once, going twice. Going one more time. They are certainly peasantries, but there's a very specific term for them. They are known as the sans culotte, not the Illuminati. The sans culotte means without fancy socks, basically, in French. So if we go over and look at a picture of Louis XIV, who we're going to talk about here in a little while, you see these fancy, fancy, dandy socks he's wearing. We're definitely having a quiz, Alex. Welcome in. But these knee breeches are called culottes. So those who didn't wear them were called the sans culottes without fancy knee breeches. Remember to clonk that follow button. So it's important because this group, known as the sans culottes, will become a powerful force in revolutionary France as we tip into the 1790s. And understanding that their general makeup is unskilled and skilled urban workers and then the landless rural peasants who would come into the city looking for day work that's who these people are so 
That's pretty close, Manny. <laughs> you lots is spelled correctly. So it's important because we're going to draw a line here, right? We're still talking about the third estate. We're still talking about common people, non-aristocratic, non-noble people. But the line gets drawn between the skilled worker and the educated worker. So instead of red socks versus white socks, it's no socks versus with socks. That's one way of looking at it to a degree. But again, then you start, you start falling into the idea of a, of a class versus class battle. And that's, it's, that's not, it's too coarse of a definition. Generally speaking, if you pull back to that really high view Marxist theory of class versus class warfare, where this revolution is the great bourgeois revolution in Marxist theory, yes, that's true. But if you look close at it, and we're going to look close at it, it just doesn't pan out. It's, it's still too general to think that way. 99% versus 1% is still not accurate. So we'll talk about the educated class, the bourgeoisie, as Doc put into chat earlier. The bourgeoisie was doctors, lawyers, merchants, lettered men, those who could, whose job revolved around paper, people who intrinsically had to read and write a ton to do their job. The, these people owned, in Marxist theory again, what the means of production were. They were the people that owned businesses. So you may, as you transition from the guild system, you may have a member of the bourgeoisie, a rich lawyer, who actually owns the blacksmith shop now. They become the owners of the means of production in 1780s, 1790s, actually 1760s to 1790s France. But they're this building economic class where more and more of the nations of France's or the kingdom of France's wealth is rooted in this growing educated force of doctors and lawyers and merchants and lettered individuals. So the problem is you have this upper middle class, right? That's who these guys are. They're the upper middle class of the third estate. They are not taking their money and putting it back into their own businesses and their own interests within their own class. What they are doing is they're buying land so that they can own the farms that the farmers are running. And excuse me as I push my notebook down so I can read the next page. But they're buying land and they're buying what's called venal office. So we're going to get into the Bourbon dynasty and how messed up it was and how Louis XIV kind of set the ball rolling in, in terms of financial disaster. But venal office is the idea that in order to make money, the kingdom of France started to sell offices in the government. No, not you had to apply for a job. Could you pay us enough to get a job? And at the time of the French Revolution, there were about 70,000 venal offices in the government of France and in the what is it called the Ministry of France. And almost all of them were venal offices. And these venal offices, you paid for them. And it was, you were buying property in a sense as a member of the bourgeoisie because you were buying a foot in the door. You were taking the money you made in the urban, you know, commoner sector, and you were launching yourself into the noble sector by buying an office that normally was a job reserved for nobility. And the thing is, is mo many, 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 many of these venal offices also came with a nobleman, meaning one day you would become not a member of the third estate anymore, but a member of the second estate. You would become a noble. But it usually took generations for that to happen. Most of these jobs were jobs. I mean, they were actual jobs you had to do. And there were a couple of them. And the greatest example is the secretary for the king, which was not a job at all. It was a title. It was about prestige and status. And I can afford to buy this job. Uh, and it was no job at all. And it came with instantaneous ennoblement. You were a noble the moment you paid them for that job. So you could buy your way out of the third estate and into the second estate. And there's reasons why that's super important, which we're gonna get into. So, venal offices included judges, which is a big part of the problem. You could buy your way into being part of the judiciary in France in the 18th century. The, the, uh, the idea of venal offices arises with Louis XIV, and the king of France during the revolution is Louis XVI. But Louis XIV came up with the concept of venal offices because Louis XIV spent money like he didn't care. 
Um, so he had to pay for it somehow, and pay to play became the way. So you were buying your way into the system if you could afford it. And I actually have to move this notebook down so I could see it, and I'm not using my keyboard as much as I thought, so that'll work out just fine. So I'm actually back from my desk talking. So it was a money-making vehicle for the crown, though. The, the, king, the ministry, the crown, those are interchangeable terms for me. The crown could not create new taxes. They, they, believe it or not, the Kingdom of France believed it was an absolute monarchy, right? Meaning I could decree something and it becomes law. That's absolutism. That is an absolute monarchy. And no kings, Louis XIV included, could just declare something to be true in law. The, he, there needed to be, there's a system of checks in a, in a vehicle called, called, called the Parlement, which laws had to be registered, and we're going to get into that whole system. But there was no way to simply declare a law to be true. And there was no vehicle to create new taxes outside of something called the Estates General. And no king wanted to call the Estates General, which is a meeting of all representatives of all of the estates, because it meant they lost control. They, they had to defer to the meeting of the estates in France and kind of what their output was. So in order to not have to raise taxes, because King Louis XIV didn't want to call the Estates General, he started this pay-to-play system of venal offices, where if you were rich enough, if you were a profitable enough doctor, a profitable enough lawyer, you were a well-off enough merchant, you could buy your way into being a judge or being a noble somewhere in the system, a job that you could be an economic advisor. But there were all these jobs scattered everywhere, where it was simply, can you pay the crown enough to take that job. So in 1780, by the time we start rolling into the discussion of the timeline we're going to have next week, 1780, there was about 1 billion livres, which is the French currency at the time, wrapped up in venal offices. And that is an insane amount of money. Think about what your brain just registered for $1 billion. And then roll the clock back, you know, 200 plus years a billion currency at the time wrapped up in pay-to-play venal office. So it's a, it's a ridiculous amount of money. It's insane for a nation to base that much of their economy around a pay-to-play system of aristocracy. Yeah. The thing about a venal office, though, is if I bought a venal office... We talked about how the ennoblement of that office becomes generational, right? So if I wanted my sons to be nobles or that my grandsons to be nobles, I would buy the venal office and it would transfer to them and then to their sons and etc. So you can only really sell the venal office once unless someone else sells it. Like if I bought it and I sold it to somebody else and the crown wanted to fee like, on that, or if my male line died and the office Read back up. So it, it, it's this single fire system where if I wanted my, my sons to be judges, I didn't have, they didn't really have to go to school to be judges. I just had to buy into the, the judiciary with the venal office. And then down the road, my son inherits my job and their son inherits their job. And it's completely broken to base your economy largely around the idea that the pro, one of the primary vehicles for raising revenue is going to be one-shot office purchases. So, the, the last group that kind of exists in the Third Estate is what I would say, those who lived nobly. So they're not having, like, the lawyers still had to go to the Parlement, which was the court of, you know, the last court of judicial review, or the local courts that they worked in. They still had to go to their jobs, right? The merchants still had to go to work. The doctors still had to go to work. No. Nope. The last group that is a part of the third estate is simply those who live nobly. Those who didn't have to go to work. They had acquired enough land. They had acquired enough business to step back and simply live like a noble, even though they weren't a noble. But they were also in the process of building up enough money to become a noble. So these people who lived nobly eventually wanted to become members of the second estate. That's where we're going next. Second estate is the aristocracy, the nobility. 
those who were above those common people. So about 1% to 2% of the population of France in 1789 is noble. And they, it's about 120,000 to 400,000 people, and it really depends on the source. And I have a lot of sources, and they all differ on this. So if you'd like to look at the sources and have an idea, type exclamation point sources in the chat, and you'll see that there are 13 books and a podcast series in there right now that outline where a lot of my information comes from. Um, but there were about, like I said, 120,000, 400,000 um, individuals of 27 million in France in 1789 that were noble, which is about 1% to 2% of the population. They owned about a quarter to a third of all the land in France. So one, this is where the 99 to 1% argument becomes valid. In terms of land ownership, sure. You have this very, very small group of nobles who own massive amounts of land in France. They, they just own huge swaths of land in France. And this ownership of huge swaths of land is going to be a problem. We're going to get to why. But the land they didn't own their nobility, her, from a hereditary perspective, had still given them feudal rights to, because the feudal system wasn't gone yet. So if you go back to where we were at the beginning, where we talked about how the feudal system kind of rolled into the three estates, it was, a linked, it was linked in terms of its evolution, the idea of people still being beholden to the land they were born on is still a thing. And for the nobles who owned land, they also still had noble rights to land where the feudal system was still in place. So they had rights to people, in a, in a sense. And the thing is, is that the nobles weren't able to participate in, in being in trade. They were not allowed to be traders, right? They weren't allowed to open a, you know, a, a shipping company. They weren't allowed to, to have a, a merchant you know, shop in a city, you know, supposedly. But then we can start comparing that to the way that LLCs work in the United States or the way that umbrella companies work, shell corporations work, where, you know, sure, I don't own that company. My very good friend, the third estate merchant, does, even though the noble po pulled in most of the profits from it. They skirted around the rules in terms of participating in the economy at large from a trade perspective through proxies. They were able to get around the explicit prohibitions on their participation in trade by simply having a surrogate. And a lot of them did it. So not only are the nobles owning this massive portion of French land, they are also owning a significant portion of the French economy. It's shrinking little by little over time because the bourgeoisie is growing in terms of its financial strength. But you can see this bubble where economically the aristocracy and the bourgeoisie kind of have the lockdown on the economic engine right so the thing is and this is what we were talking about 99 percent versus one percent class warfare they were not a unified class at all the second estate is not just noble it's not just aristocracy there was divisions within the aristocracy. And the first is what I call, and what is called, the old or sword nobility. These are the, you've held these lands for 400 years in my family, and blah, 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 I am entitled to this because my last name is such and such, right? These are the people that have been nobles for a long, 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 long time. They believed very vigorously in their right to be as special as they were. And they looked down their nose at everybody else who was a more recent noble, like maybe those people who just bought their way into the nobility via venal office. So you have these very, very upright, I am a noble in France, and my family goes back to the founding of the kingdom 500 years ago, and who are you? Oh, you just bought your way into the judiciary. And they would, they, they would snub their nose at those people. Those people were called the new or the robed nobility. Because you basically put on a robe and became a noble, right? Versus my family fought at the war of such and such, defending King so and so. And that's why they were called the sword. Yeah, we are from the time of William the Conqueror. And the, things like that. The thing about the old nobility, or the sword nobility, is they were broke. 
because of the way the economic system worked, a lot of these old noble families didn't get, they weren't smart enough to kind of skirt the rules and get involved with um, the mercantile system as it was developing into the free trade system and, you know, modern liberalism that Adam Smith would develop. But these people, these families didn't plan their long-term futures well. And many, many, many of these old, noble, very conservative families politically were broke. How they pulled off remaining haughty and they took out loans on their name. Or they did something else. They let their sons marry the very, very, very rich daughters of the robed nobility. So we don't like you, these people who just bought your office. Who are you? But let me introduce you to my son. I see that you have very sizable stacks of gold. And that's how they would reinvigorate their finances through marriage. And that would be called um, gilding your arms. The term that means basically you would bring someone's huge tracts of land. <laughs> That's exactly it, Beast. But you would be bringing in a, a family member and the dowry that comes with that and the rights to that new robed noble's assets that come with that by marrying your sword noble son to the robed noble daughter. And that is how a lot of these old families stayed afloat. They would simply dip their hand into the pool of the new nobility and get the money out that they could via marriage. So the new robe nobility, like I said, it's these people, these bourgeoisie who bought venal office, these, those who lived nobly who eventually stepped into the noble ranks of the second estate because... They could pay for it, basically. There were other ways, but the, the big way was through venal office for almost 200 years. So, the new nobility, um, they became, like I said, this vehicle for economic recovery for the old nobles. But um, there were still rich old nobles. I'm not trying to say that the entire old sword nobility was broke. A lot of them were, but not all of them. A lot of them were not broke. And they lived with the king at Versailles, which is this palace that was built out basically on the lands of a hunting lodge by Louis XIV. And it was massive, and it's where the treaty that ended World War I was signed. But it's, it is opulent. It is ostentatious. It is a sight to behold. And it was designed to be an outward sign of, look at how amazing I am, King Louis XIV. But the rich old sword nobility actually lived at Versailles with the king. And they, the system was so jacked that these nobles would actually jockey for position in the reception room so that they could be there when the king woke up in the morning. And as the king descended his stairs and came down, they wanted to be in his line of sight so that they would get his favor. And that is how messed up the, the entire nobility system in France was from about the time of Louis XIV until the time of Louis XVI. Um, but these old nobles dominated government ministry jobs. The, the jobs that ran the business of state. So you're talking about first minister, minister of war, controller general, who was the minister of finance. The jobs that were really important to running the, the country were old nobility mostly. There would be some new nobility, and there's some notable exceptions in there for all of that, and we're going to talk about a couple of them next week. But generally speaking, the old sword nobility is who was running the show. And they would tolerate or look down upon basically anybody else, generally speaking. But, but, within these nobles, can't just categorize old nobles hated new nobles and new nobles were up jumpers it doesn't work that way really because even within the concept of nobles there were liberal nobles and this guy on the screen is important for pretty much the next 50 episodes Bree, you can guess at who he is because you've already mentioned his name once but this is gilbert de Montier, the marquis de lafayette the marquis de lafayette is actually important to american history as well this painting of him depicts him around the 1790s. Uh, he'll be relevant until the 1830s. Uh, he was also relevant in the American Revolution. 
the Marquis de Lafayette went to America when it was still the 13 colonies, revolting against the crown of England for basically tax purposes. And he walked in to the camps of the Continental Army before France ever committed to assisting the, what would become the United States. And he said, I'm here to learn. And it took back everybody that was involved. And you're talking like Hamilton, Washington. Um, the indiv- George Washington actually came to see Lafayette, Lafayette as a surrogate son, like, a, a, like, a, like almost as a son. But the way in which he conducted himself as a very young man coming into America in the, 17, you know, the 1770s and saying, no, I'm here to learn. Because most of the European officers who were coming over to help, to help the colonists were not looking to help. They were looking to lead. They were looking to show these backwards colonial idiots how to actually win a war. Where Lafayette, a noble Frenchman, came over and said, no, 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 I'm no general. I don't want the rank of general. I want to learn from you. And it took everybody aback. And it was so out of, it it, it screams to the notion of liberal thinking that would be this dude's hallmark. That I do not believe I am entitled to something based on my name. He was there to study under those who were going to lead a war. And eventually it would become super important for him for the rest of his life. But the Marquis de Lafayette, if you've heard him and you see things named after him, that's who this guy is. He eventually would become a general in the American Revolution. He would become a French general as well. But initially, he was a humble noble, which was like, what? So the Marquis de Lafayette will become, you're going to hear his name a bunch of times in the next couple of weeks. And then probably about... Two and a half months from now, he'll disappear for a while, and then a little bit after that, he'll show back up. And he's really one of these, these guys that had the best intentions along the way. Humble noble was an oxymoron, yeah, for the most part. I mean, again, there are, there are liberal nobles, and they make up a, a significant crop of people who are going to be important toward empowering the third estate politically, but they were not the bulk of the nobility. That's where I was saying that the 99 versus 1% isn't really applicable you can't say that because this guy right here right he's a part of that one percent but he's part of that one percent who believed that in order for the for france to survive its future the nobles had to give up all their privileges which was insane he was one of the people saying at a many we're going to talk about next week that the estates noble or states noble states general needed to be called and they were like what no because what's that do it it takes the power out of the out of the ministry and out of the king's hands this is a person who was not afraid to usurp the traditional approach to things because he felt there was a better way to do things in the good interest of others it wasn't a self-serving interest and there are many nobles like him that i will just continue to call liberal nobles but they weren't as prevalent as the look down your nose I have been here for 800 years. Look at how, look at my family's sword and the line of my people on the wall. No, there, there, there were still more of those. So, we're going to get to the last estate that we have to cover, and we'll take our first break. Because I know this is a lot of information, and I'm still surprised you're all sitting here listening to me talk about it, and hopefully you're having fun. But the last estate is the first estate. Gilly had the first estate nailed before, the clergy. There were about 130,000 members of the Catholic clergy in France. Now, this first episode won't exceed three hours. But the, the first estate, the clergy, about 130,000 members, people, of the 27 million people in France in 1789. So they were basically a microcosm of the second and third estates, where you had the everyday clergy, right? The everyday priest at a parish working, and we're talking about Catholic priests. Catholicism is the dominant religion, even though Calvinism and Protestantism is still all, you know, elsewhere in Europe, especially England. Um, the Catholic Church is what is important in France. Um, but they're a microcosm of the second and third estate. Nuns too, yes. Nuns, monastic orders, everything. Um, but when I clergy means clergy. It means Anyone who's involved in the church, but you have to also remember that this is the 1780s and it's Europe and women didn't have that many rights. But So you have the 
the everyday parish priest who you know ran their parish parish they did the day-to-day -day ministering they saw very little of the money that the church made and then you have the bishops the big money guys who tended to be the second third fourth sons of noble families because they couldn't inherit a damn thing so if you were the second son or a son of an individual who could not go, I don't know, into the military or had a physical disability that prevented you from really excelling as a lawyer or somewhere else. Someone like Talleyrand is one of these individuals who we'll talk about in a little while. You would be sent into the seminary. And with the expectation, as you enter the seminary as a noble son, that I'm going to be a bishop somewhere pretty soon. And it happened all the time. So you have this noble bishop versus common priest line that very much emulates at a very general level what happens between the first or the second and third estates so the church of the catholic church of france is actually really weird there's two things about it that are weird so one it owns about 10 percent of the land in france so we talked about how the second estate owned a third of the land and how the church now owns a tenth of the land so you're it's, it's ridiculous. 43-ish percent of the land in France is owned by nobles, rich clergymen, bishops, and archbishops. That's a huge problem. We're going to get into why it's a huge problem. We start breaking down the Ancien Regime, which is going to happen after we talk about the history of the Bourbon Dynasty. But we've been going for almost an hour. Robe nobles, sir, nobles, clergy, and commoners, the, the third estate stir. But a lot of information, and this is a grid break point. So we are reaching the end of point one, the three estates. Here's the thing. Do you ever wonder why the press in our modern world called the fourth estate? Now you know why. Because the press was an emerging thing in France in the 1780s. The idea of free press. You must play me again. What? Um, best two out of three. No way! Yes way. That <laughs> said plum. But the idea of an emerging free press is a new thing in Europe, especially in France, at the end of the 1780s. The Duc d'Orléans, who was one of the princes of the blood of the royal family, enabled the free press in France quite heavily. They have the first estate, the clergy, the second estate, the nobility, third estate, commoners, and later on a little bit in history, the idea of a fourth estate, the press, journalists, would emerge, something that had to be protected independently. And now you know why it's called the fourth estate. That was the modern day lesson from point one. The rest of it's important for the rest of us. We're going to stand up, take a break. I'm going to kind of clear my throat and get a drink, go to the bathroom. Make sure you stretch your legs. Be right back. We'll pick up with the brief history of the Bourbon Dynasty as we continue through episode 1.1 .1 of Dexter's Heavy Metal History. Thanks for hanging out, everybody. I'll be right back. Dang. We're history. Clonk that follow button.
So, let's take it aside here and explain what's going on with McDingle Bizzle. Last night we were playing Sea of Thieves. Doof is on deck! Dodson, here! Last night we were playing Sea of Thieves and Manny brings out a cat that has no name. And on our ship, the rule is if you bring out a default named pet, we will name it. And I named it McDingle Bizzle. And Manny was on a conference call for his job and forgot to mute himself when he brought his cat back to the deck and said, I present to you McDingle Bizzle. And it went over his work conference call. And so there's now a jump box in his work environment called McDingle Bizzle. There's a shirt on the store that says, I present to you McDingle Bizzle. And now all this other stuff that he's talking about in chat that references McDingle Bizzle. Excellent! Dudley <laughs> One, what's up? Dudley One, I always see the two eyes there and want to pronounce it that way. But that's, where, that's what the McDingle Bizzle conversation is about right there. So hopefully, um, as we get ready to go in a second point here, the brief history of the Bourbon Dynasty, uh, hopefully you guys are enjoying yourself. <laughs> McDingle Bizzle emote win. My lord? Yep. No problem, Fix. Fix. Perm. I saw Fix. No problems, Perm. I knew you had to be late. That's fine. I'm glad you're all here. Um, it's a lot of talking for the first hour, and uh, hopefully you guys gleaned a lot of understanding about the basic makeup of who the people of France are around the 1780s, because it'll be hugely important to everything. But we're going to talk about the last group, right? The group that doesn't have an estate. The end-all, be-all, head honchos of the, quote, absolute, even though it really wasn't, monarchy of the French. <laughs> Mads, welcome in. So, we're going to... Well, then, welcome to the outlaws. Indeed. Perm would be a noble by purchase, yeah. So we're going to talk about the bourbons. The B-O-U-R, B-O-N's of France. Those of you that want to make sure you get your spelling right and to answer Manny's question, no. Spelling will not be an aspect of the test. As long as I get the gist of what you're saying, I get French names are difficult, I'm not going to be picky. If I get, oh yeah, they got it, you're going to get the free pack of cards. So we have to set the Wayback Machine from the 1780s, which is where we're going to live this, the end of this week and next week, and go all the way back to 1268, when the younger daughter to the estate of Bourbon married the son of King Louis IX. And you have to remember that the king, the Bourbon's kings at this time were basically kings of this little area down here called Navarre. They weren't kings of the rest of this. They were just kings of this little tiny piece of blue outline right here. And that was it. They plugged away for about nine generations and became kings of Navarre and the Pyrenees in the process. And in the 1580s, so we've fast forwarded, you know, 300 years, Bourbon Henry of Navarre ascends to the French throne in 1589. So we go from 1268, where they're kind of just a king of a small little backwater stretch of land in the Pyrenees, to the 1580s the War of the Three Henrys, and the Bourbon King of Navarre becomes king of all of this. So, 300 years set to happen. You go from King Louis IX, the King of Navarre, to, I can't remember which king it was. Oh yeah, he becomes King Henry the, uh, the, King Henry the Fourth of France. So, when you talk about the French kings, you have to realize that they weren't the French kings all the way back to Louis the First, right? Louis the the fourteenth, the thirteenth becomes the first major king of France named Louis. Okay, so King Henry the Fourth was assassinated in sixteen ten. So from the fifteen eight from fifteen eighty nine to sixteen ten, he ruled, but then he was assassinated, and Louis the Thirteenth becomes king at ten years old in sixteen ten. So now, 1610 to 1780, not that much time between the two areas we're talking about. Henry VIII was an English king. And we talked about Anne Boleyn and all that the other day. Yeah, brilliant. Ten-year-old becomes king. The very last calling of the estates general, which we have talked about kind of offhand a few times, this body of all the estates that comes together and votes and can kind of enforce their will on the monarchy, the last time it meets in history until the point we're talking to is 1614 that's how just allergic the monarchs of france were to 
to trying to use the estates general to get new taxes. At the end of his minority, the end of Louis XIII's minority, this is where those of you who have seen The Three Musketeers are going to be like, oh, I know that name. The principal minister of King Louis XIII's ministry is... Anybody want to guess the name of the principal minister of King Louis XIII's ministry now that I've made a Three Musketeer reference? No, it's not Kevin. Going once. Going twice, he was played by Tim Curry. Oh, there it is, Rockets! Like, what's that guy's name? Cardinal Richelieu. Yeah, Tim Curry. It's the right actor. Not Mel Brooks. Cardinal Richelieu. The character you've seen depicted in Alexandre Dumas' Three Musketeers works, he was the bad guy. Actually, wasn't that much of a bad guy. Uh, he was a dominant force for sure. He, ban he began this period of consolidation under King Louis XIII where uh, the power of all of these different areas in France was consolidated more toward Paris. And we're going to get to what the generalités are in a little bit, but it's to give you the idea of all these regions were kind of governed by their own little independent sets of rules, and Cardinal Richelieu started to consolidate that power back to the crown. Richelieu, I don't have any, thanks. Funny guys. So... The whole reason that Louis XIII is important is because of Cardinal Richelieu. And it is the era in which, if you read the Three Musketeers, that's supposedly happening in that area. That area, like 1610 to 1640 is when the Three Musketeers is supposed to be taking place. And the major thing is, is that it led to this massive consolidation, the centralization of, of, of power. So instead of independent lords and a fuel system out in the little areas of France all having a much higher degree of autonomy, they were much more answerable to the crown in Paris. And then, both Cardinal Richelieu and Louis XIII died within the same year. That year was 1643. Louis XIV, the Sun King, ascends to the throne at the grand ripe old age of four. Louis XIV is a force. That's how you spell it, Dustin. It's close. Not that son. Four years old. So you went from a ten-year-old inheriting the crown to a four-year-old inheriting the crown. Louis XIV would reign for 72 years, and the only person who's coming close ever to outlasting him is the current Queen of England, Elizabeth II. 72 years the man ruled France. He built the Palace of Versailles. And the Palace of Versailles, as we mentioned in the first segment, is this ostentatious... I'll actually see if I can I'll grab a picture for you. A tab over here. So let me get some good shots of the Palace of Versailles for you guys. Yeah, it's it's dumb, stupid, big. So we'll just go through some Google pictures of the Palace of Versailles real quick so you guys can see it. Ostentatious, massive, just this big, ridiculous, huge palace. Just gigantic. Again, it's where the treaty that, en that ended World War I was signed. The gardens are fantastic. Yep. But it was built by Louis XIV, and it cost a ton of money. And you're going to hear me start saying this. Louis XIV spent money like he didn't have a concept that there was a maximum amount in the world. Louis XIV built Versailles. He finalized what would become the Ancien Regime, the structure that Louis XV and Louis XVI inherit to their detriment. He spent lavishly. He created these massive financial de deficits for the, for the crown, where the program of penal offices, the let's buy ourselves into a judgeship or secretary of the king, or but basically that pay-to-play system of becoming a noble over time comes into play. Louis XIV institutes that because he had to, right? He was spending on wars with everybody, and he built this big, massive palace. And this was a guy who wanted the spotlight of the world to shine on him, and it did. At this time, in, this, in the mid-17th century and into the 18th century, Louis XIV makes sure that French culture, language, architecture, everything French becomes the dominant force culturally in Europe all the way to what would eventually become Russia. 
Uh, that's a great way to think of it. He wanted to become Pharaoh. He felt he was deified. And the concept of the Sun King is a direct reference to the idea that he felt he was godlike. So godlike that spending money and the amount of money that he spent didn't matter to him. And this is where the pebble off the mountain that rolls down for 150 years and blows up in the French Revolution starts. It's hard to imagine, like you, especially in, in, in America where we're taught, oh, it was this, you know, we had the French and Indian War, which is actually called the Seven Years War. And then it was this period where it was a little bit of a lull and all of a sudden these rules started coming down from the English Parliament with all these taxes and boom, revolution, right? And it was relatively quick, 20 years. The idea, the political factors that roll the French Revolution into what it's going to be, the very first major piece kicks off with how badly Louis XIV managed finances. All it takes is one person to start a revolution. Eh, it's a get it to when the French Revolution started. Like we can generally say when we talk about the American Revolution that it was building, it was it was metastasizing, there was con there was, you know, friction between things, but basically when it all went down was when shots were fired in seventeen seventy five at Lexington and Concord. I actually think the uh the Boston Massacre is when the American Revolution starts, when the first British civilians really British troops fired into civilians. Um but one way or the other, you're still talking about this super compressed timeline in comparison to what we're talking about, right? You're talking about the Palace of Versailles being built before the turn of the, seventh, the, seventh, uh, the 18th century, and Louis XIV basically going, I don't care, have money to be my friend or to treat me like a god, and we're going to build this massive, huge building and grounds and gardens that have no business being built on the French dime because who cares how much it costs? And who cares how much it costs is a big problem. So he made France the preeminent kingdom in Europe. So let's see. I should have wrote this date down. He died. There it is. I found it. It's in my notes. I have to keep looking down because, oh, yeah, by the way, um, this is the notebook, and it's a Sea of Thieves notebook for anyone that was curious. The moleskin that I just, I like the size of it, but I keep looking down. And I have to find where my notes are because I, there's no way to keep this all memorized. So he dies in 1715. So he ruled from 1643 to 1715. And now we are what? 1715 to 1789 is not a very long time. I mean, in the grand scheme of things. Louis the 15th, who was the great grandson of Louis the 14th. So Louis the 14th outlived his son and his grandsons. And his great grandson becomes king at the ripe old age of anybody? Five. So a ten-year-old, then a four-year-old, then a five-year-old are the successive kings of France from basically the 17th century into the 18th century. <laughs> so the thing with Louis the 15th and why you don't really hear his name, you hear Louis the 14th a lot, you hear Louis the 16th a lot because they're major historical people. The reason you don't hear Louis the 15th a lot, not really that interested in being king. Just wasn't great at it. Louis XIV was a great king in the sense of did a lot. He was a bad king in the sense of spent a lot. But he was a presence. He was a, no, he was a massive force on history. And you hear King Louis XVI a lot because get, he was in the middle of the French Revolution, which is the, probably one of the most defining events in human history. France is looking a bit childish. It will stop. It will stop, I promise you. So the big thing that Louis the Fifteenth did is he. Um, we'll talk about European politics for a minute. So everyone kind of knows that Britain and France hated each other for about 150 years. There was all these wars that got fought between them. It's one of the major reasons France got involved in the American Revolution. They fought the Hundred Years War. They fought the Seven Years War. And at the end of all of that, um, well, not actually at the end of all that, but because of all of that, Louis the Fifteenth initiated an alliance with. Austria, who was their next-door neighbor. And this isn't Austria, the tiny Austria that you think of when you think of that little country below Germany. You're talking about the Austrian Habsburgs, who were part of the Holy Roman Empire, which stretched all the way to Turkey and down into the Middle East. So the Holy Roman Empire was built on the idea that all of these little duchies and kingdoms that were part of it all voted for who their emperor would be. And for a long, 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 long time, the Austrian Habsburg dynasty had kind of run that office. They had been the Holy Roman Imperial family for a couple hundred years. Um, 
But to shore up against the English, Louis XV says, I'm going to create an alliance with the Austrians. And the French hated the Austrians. Like, hated them. Like, Yankees-Red Sox rivalry hated the Austrians. So it was a politically not popular move, especially because the alliance with Austria starts the Seven Years' War, which rages inside of Europe, costs France a lot of land, and bleeds over into North America, and that's what we know to be the French and Indian War. So the reason that we fought the French and Indian War because Louis XV created an alliance with the Austrians that the Prussians didn't like, basically, to not go too far into what caused the Seven Years' War. But we had this, we, we have Last of the Mohicans, you know, with James Fenimore Cooper, and it's a great movie, and it's about the French and Indian War, but this is this tiny, tiny, tiny piece of a war that's raging in Europe because Louis the Fifteenth, who I will get a picture of on the screen, because we're still looking at Louis the Fourteenth. Because this guy decides to create an alliance with Austria to shore up against the English. Crazy how it all just breaks down. So the big thing that this produces, well, Louis XIV didn't make the best decisions either. We're going to get into why that is in about an hour probably. But Louis XV creates this, this um, alliance with Austria. It's massively unpopular. And what it does produce is... The eighth daughter of the emperor, of the Holy Roman Emperor, who happens to be an Austrian Habsburg, Marie Antonia, is betrothed to the grandson of King Louis XV, who would be the guy we come to know as Louis XVI. So the eighth daughter named Marie Antonia or Maria Antonia, would be restyled Marie Antoinette. So the French queen that was married to King Louis the Sixteenth was an Austrian princess, and everyone in France really didn't like Austrians all that much. So you can see how the concept of we don't like this queen really starts before they ever had a chance to find out she was aloof and a spendthrift and all that stuff. She was destined to fail politically because of who she was before she ever became queen. He didn't do much, King Louis XV, to reform any of the problems. He inherited massive debts from King Louis XIV. He's running loans with interest to Dutch banking systems that they just had to keep taking out loans to pay down the interest on the prior loans from, and it just they couldn't get ahead of it, much like people who find themselves in credit card debt these days. And this is the period in time, the end of the reign of King Louis the Fifteenth, where what we will talk about at the last side of this, this is when the French Enlightenment gets going, the early 18th century. Um, they, everyone knew they didn't, they weren't hiding anything, Rocket. Everyone knew who she was. Um, they simply restyled her to fit in more with. The French language system. It wasn't a matter of hiding that she was Austrian. Everyone knew where she was from. It may have been a naive effort to do that, but there was no, no hiding the fact that he was from the court of the Habsburg. So, 1756 is when that alliance with Austria happened, right? So we're starting to creep up onto the area where we really, really, really want to talk about. So, King Louis the Fifteenth dies, and King Louis the Sixteenth ascends to the throne in 1774, one year before shots are fired at Lexington and Concord, two years before the Declaration of Independence of the United States, at the age of 19. So finally, an adult ascends to the throne. He'd been married to Marie Antoinette since they were 14 and 13. Um, and the funny thing about that relationship is they wouldn't actually consummate the marriage for seven years. So they actually hadn't consummated their marriage by the time that he was crowned King of France. Um, he was smart. King Louis XVI was a smart guy. Um, he wasn't a dumb king. He wasn't an uninterested king. Well, we can get into that. You know, do know that the practice of royal of royalty at the time, and going back several hundred years, was when a new couple, a new royal couple, was wed. They would actually go to bed with an audience, right? There would be a circle of people around them watching them consummate the marriage, and it didn't happen. Yeah, they got watched. It's weird. <laughs> it's really weird. Uh, eventually, pressure from her brother, who was now the Holy Roman Emperor, from her mother, 
uh, over time, it, 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 it made them tip the scales, and they did have a daughter, and then a son, and then another daughter, and another son. Um, but it was embarrassing for, the, the, for King Louis XVI because everyone knew it. Everyone knew the marriage wasn't consummated, and then his younger brother started having kids ahead of him, which was also a problem because you had no crown prince. And on that note, does anyone remember in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure when Bill is describing, or sorry, Ted is describing Joan of Arc, and she said, he says, she made this guy named Dauphin king. The part that's funny about that, and the part that sticks out to me every time I see that scene, is Dauphin, the title, not a name, and Dauphin means crown prince. Next time you watch Bill and Ted, listen for that line. Dauphin is crown prince, not king. But anyway, back to Louis the Sixteenth. Hopefully we'll be saying Louis the Sixteenth for a while. Okay, so he was he was a smart kid, but he was super shy. He was a, a, a guy who didn't want the spotlight. And you're talking about a a royal system built by Louis the Fourteenth, who was the Sun King, who wanted the spotlight shown on him and his regality at all times. And then in comes two kings later, a guy who's like How's it going? Um, uh, he was not prepared to be the focus of everything that highly, especially that young. And he, he wanted to solve the problems of France. He really did. But he had a horrible Achilles heel politically. Louis XIV was, he would vacillate with opinion wildly. So one advisor would come in and say, you have to do it this way. And he'd say, okay, let's stick to our guns and do it. And then public opinion would be, you know, oh, we won't stand for that. And he'd be like, okay, I'll capitulate to whatever you want. He blew with the wind way too much to be an effective leader. Policy couldn't stay on track. And because of how much he vacillated between, between the policies he wanted to pursue, he just couldn't commit to any. He liked hunting. He liked tinkering with locks, but he was not a powerful ruler. And we'll get into why that's really important when we start talking about the Enlightenment here in a little bit. But that's, that's the second section. It took 20 minutes. The brief history of the French Bourbons from the initiation of their real dynasty in about 1268 until Louis XIV becomes king in 1774. He isn't, the thing about Louis XIV, Gilly, is he's not dumb. He understood what the problems were. He just couldn't put his, he couldn't dig his heel into a solution. He understood what was broken. We're going to talk about what's broken here in a minute. But he understood what was broken. He wasn't dumb. He understood that there were problems with the regime and what they were. And he had good advice. He had one very good advisor who was there almost the entire time Louis was king. But he just couldn't stand up to, he was conflict averse. That's a good way to put it. He, he did not like the idea of the most recent person or persons in his face not agreeing with him. And so he would change his mind. Yeah, Louis XIV, well, Louis XVI did whatever he was whispered in his ear. Louis XIV most certainly did not do whatever was whispered in his ear. Yeah, it's, it is about backbone. It is about conviction, sticking to one's guns. All of these ideas are things that Louis the, four, the Louis the Sixteenth did not have. And they would be to his detriment as he tried to navigate through what was coming, which is a series of tornadoes in conjunction rolling through his kingdom. And it is important to think of the French Revolution in those terms. A lot of people think of it as a massive hurricane that engulfed the kingdom for a long period of time when it really was this major thing hit and then there's a lull and this major thing happened and then it was a lull and this major thing happened and then holy crap things are really falling apart because we've been hit three times really hard. That's kind of what is going to go down here. So, Louis XIV definitely had a backbone. Louis XVI most certainly did not. So, we'll pivot into the ancien regime and here's the funny part is when we did the, the kind of the test for this uh, I like mentioning this is Fiche was spell checking me and thought I left the T off Ancien to make it ancient. But it is Ancien. Ancien regime. Again, it was kind of consolidated. The, the, the road to it was started by Cardinal Richelieu with Louis XIII. Louis XIV really finalized its form. And it 
rules France in the same way that I described in talking about the three estates since basically the time of Louis XIII. You know, offices and the different hierarchies of people, inheriting that from a feudal system, all that becomes the foundational elements of the Ancien Regime. By the way, we'll talk about, we'll give you a picture of Louis XIV or Louis the Sixteenth really quick. This is that guy. As he was a little bit older, noticed is still wearing the fancy high knee socks called the culottes. French pronunciation sounds like a sinus infection. Yes, it does. All right, we're going to go back over to here, though. Talk about provinces. So, we are going to talk about the third point now. Ancien Regime. And why it was so stupid. Still saying pantyhose? That'll work. As long as you know that the bourgeoisie and above wore them, and the unskilled and skilled laborers and rural people did not, and that's who the sans culottes are, we're good. That's the part you need to know. So, the Kingdom of France, as we roll into the 1780s, is not a uniform state. It's not a place where there's a set of laws and they apply to people based on their class universally. It is the furthest you're ever going to get from that. There are 39-ish provinces, which are, if you can pick them out, and I am sorry for the contrast, but this is the best map of the area, area I can find without paying a ton of money. These blue outlines are provinces. There are 39-ish of them, they vacillate from time to time in number based on the different governing apparatuses of France, but there are 39 provinces. They are rooted in the old feudal domains. And each region, each one of these blue outlined regions has their own distinct rights, privileges, based on when they were brought under the control of the crown of France. So the rules that apply to Provence and the rules that apply to Brittany could be very different based on when they were incorporated into the, man, the, the larger kingdom. And that's a province, basically. Remember to clonk that follow button. And then there are generalites. There are generalites, there are three basic Brittany. Yeah, that, that's how we spell it after Gilly kills his third horse. But then you have generalites, and you have two basic types, the Pays d'Election and the Pays des Tats. The Pays d'Election were the green ones, the ones that were, had been a part of the kingdom for a long time, and they basically followed more standardized rules. And you'll notice that the borders of these Pays, these generalites, do not in any way line up with the borders that make up the provinces. The pinkish areas on the outside, the Pays de Tats, they were, they have their own rules based on when they became part of the kingdom. And a very important one will be out here in Dauphine, where their, ca their provincial capital is Grenoble. Uh, they have certain rights around being able to call their own estates provincial, the estates provincial being a body that feeds to the estates general when the estates general is called. They can call their estates provincial to help manage governmental matters in their province, whereas people who live in the green ones, the Pays d'Election, they could not. So we already have these two very differing sets where I might be in the Pays de Tas as a part of Dauphine, but if you look at where does that generalité stop? In a different province. The province is governed by an intendant, which adheres to the rules and lines of the generalité even though the government apparatus operates within the borders of the province. So it's completely broken. It's like having counties overlap from a legal and political perspective. Your husband's ancestors are from Brittany? Two T's? That's, yes, two T's. So you have these generalites. There were 36 of them on the eve of the revolution. They were kind of equal in size and how they were outlined. They do not care whatever about those provincial borders at all. They couldn't, the, the jurisdictional lines of the Generalité and where the privileges of those Generalités are empowered care not at all about the borders of the provinces. Not at all. And they were run by royal intendants. Royal intendants being the important thing, meaning crown appointed attend intendants versus popularly elected governors, which run provinces. And popular elections is kind of a wonky thing. 
you had to pay a certain amount of taxes and you had to be a part of a certain class and generally that meant the upper ranks of the bourgeoisie and the nobility could vote but you have the crown appointing one person in charge of an area that overlaps with a, an area that is governed by an individual elected by the people Number 98 sounds like the fall of Rome. A little bit. Welcome in. I was hoping you'd make it, man. Number 98 is my very good friend. Has a degree in history, so now I feel super judged. Um, but you, we're talking about the difference between the provinces and the generalites and the, the permissions and privileges that exist within those generalites as compared to where the borders of the provinces are and how they overlap, and it makes no sense. Right? So, local municipalities... These are more localized municipalities within the Generalites and the provinces that have their own borders that, guess what, don't line up with the borders of the provinces or the Generalites. You have local governments, not provincial governments, or governments of the Generalites that overlap into the borders of the other two. So it's like France drew a map and then threw it away when they drew the, the local map. Politically, the reason the Generalites exist is because they were generally brought in that way by treaty when a territory, you know, acceded to joining the French kingdom, and that was the way in which they kept their their privileges. But the way in which the the province, the provincial lines were drawn later on, just didn't care about some of those lines and screwed things up. So within the specific governmental areas, the more local areas, you still have additional different rights and privileges for the people the nobles that are going to stack up to and against at times with the rights and privileges of being a member of a specific generalite or where you live in a specific province. Laws with clause and subclass. <laughs> Dr. Death gives number 98. Okay. Laws with clause and subclass. It's more a collision of what law was what, where, to whom. And the system was devised, it looks like it was devised in a way to make sure that no one person in France was under the same set of rules. So, the, the best part about this is this, right? We talked about how the Catholic Church was really important. So we have provinces, generalites, local governmental you know, regions, and then we talk about how the church drew things. The diocese of Catholic France do not line up whatsoever with the provinces, the generalites, or the local governmental lines. The Catholic Church said, we don't care what you're doing, we're going to do our own thing. And they did. So there were... How many? 136 dioceses and arched in... Uh, was it? Dioceses, which did not respect any of the provincial lines that were broken up into 18 uh, archbishoprics. So you have, and this is important, the French ecclesiarchy, the church, has rights to collect a thing called the tithe, which we're, the tithe, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. But they're collecting their money over borders that cross into generalites and different local governmental lines and across different provincial lines and these lines that are all kinds of lines that are different lines from the lines next to them really, really are going to matter here in a minute. And the reason I'm outlining this is if you overlay this on top of each other, you're going to see a series of borders slammed up against one another, both from an ecclesiastical perspective, a local government perspective, the generalite, which is the way in which a kingdom was haphazardly assembled, and the provincial map, which is how the kingdom would really like to govern itself. And none of them, none of them, in any sense. They did cross country lines, but there's a specific distinction on the border territories where the French crown actually retained the right from the pope to appoint its own priests. So within the diocese, that mattered. Now, when you crossed over the line, you could be under a French priest that was appointed by the king, but was governing an area, let's say, in what would eventually become Belgium, because let's be honest, the country of Belgium doesn't exist yet, and the country of Germany doesn't exist yet. So... It's, it's not as important to what we're going to talk about in terms of how things are broken, but that is true. And then we'll talk about the last thing that really, I think it's the last thing. Make sure it's the last thing. Yeah, it is the last thing. Last thing and how jacked this is. Because you would hope we'd be all done, right? Church lines, the 
patchwork of sewing a, a kingdom together lines, the local governmental lines, and the provincial lines, right? Which all outline different privileges, different permissions, different entitlements, because um, no. The laws and court system of France is broken into two sections. <laughs> the northern portion of France generally adhered to a system of common law. The southern part of France generally adhered to a code system which can find its roots back in Rome. So if you compare that map, that map, that map, that map, you can see there are areas that are, con that are code law and there are areas that are common law that overlap all those lines, right? Lines, lines, everywhere is lines. Very true. The problem with the legal system is that it has to take into account the code system versus the common law system. What diocese are we in? What generalite are we in? What local jurisdiction are we in? And what province are we in? In order to arrive at what body of law applies to someone, then you have to take into account who that person is and how much the property at stake in the disagreement costs. You know, are you a noble? Are you not? How much is that horse worth? How much is that house worth? How much was that field worth net over time? Oh, that field branches into two different generalities, and you can see how stupid this gets real fast with anybody adjudicating anything judicially. So this is like, which mile marker are we? Because then I have to take into account this code or law, pretty much. The, the factors that play into how, what law applies to whom and what is just screwed. Because you think our legal system in the modern West is dumb and you'll get to understand why it is the way it is when we get to Napoleon. But before Napoleon and Napoleonic Code, this is how a lot of places were. They just kept on inheriting laws and rules over centuries that made getting to law and getting any sort of satisfaction impossible. You could spend two years in a French court system in this era just to find out what laws applied to you. So the things that really mattered here were geography, the type of complaint brought to, to, to court, the social status of the defendant, and the category of the property. Those things all mattered on top of all of these lines. And then you have the other problem, the major problem in the judicial system, which we've already talked about. What's the other major problem in the judicial system? It has nothing to do with all these lines and who, who, what the status of the defendant is and what the category of the property is and how much it costs and all that. What's the other big problem with the judiciary by this time in France, by the 1780s? We've talked about it. What is it? It is. Chat goes silent. I'll take a sip of my drink while you think about it. Nobody? That's it. Turry's got it. Judges bought their positions. The judiciary is not in any way, shape, or form accountable to anybody. It is a pay-to-play system where, whether it was this generation or two generations ago or five generations ago, Somebody bought their way into being a judge because 70,000 venal offices in France and almost all of them, including all of the judgeships, were bought and paid for. They were paid to play offices. So you have all these different overlapping lines, and then you have the fact that the judge is going to hear your case is more interested in how much you, money you can give him as opposed to actually ruling on the case fairly. So that's going to break us down into something else which I don't have a map of. The Parlement, which is actually Parliament, P-A-R-L-E-M-E-N-T, but it's pronounced Parlement. There was originally one Parlement, and it was in Paris. And what the Parlement is, is a court of final appeal. Think of it like the Supreme Court in a way, except instead of nine justices, there were thousands of justices, and they would sit in a large room and render judgment by vote, and it was comprised of aristocracy that comprised this middle wedge between the old sword nobility and the new road mo mo nobility because these were people that had bought judicial office and had held on to them through the family over time so they kind of were born into being a judge in the court of final review so they were filled with conservative old noble families 
by this time who really wanted to maintain things the way they were. And then over time, the one Paris Parlement uh, was broken up into jurisdictions of 13 different regional par parlements. So there's a Parlement in Grenoble down in Dauphine. There's a Parlement in Reims uh, up in Brittany. There are Parlements everywhere. And there's a big distinction between the Paris Parlement and the Provincial Parlements. And we're going to get to that next week about why they felt the way they did about certain things. But the most important thing right now is the Parlements were the courts of final appeal. They didn't give a damn about all these lines whatsoever. As long as you fell within the provincial boundary, you were able to bring your complaint to them. So it kind of consolidated all these lines up to one final court, but getting there was a problem. And the Parlement itself and the members of it had their own specific rights and privileges within France. The big thing, and this is where we talked about back in the day in this, in this uh, stream where the kings of France did not want to have to call the Estates General to get taxes and that it really isn't an absolute monarchy is any time the French king wants to make an edict law, they have to register that law with the Parliament, the Parlement, or the Parlements as time goes on. So they actually have to walk down, or not they won't walk down, but their ministers will go down to the Parlement, they will put those edicts in front of the Parlement, and the Parlement is not a rubber stamp. The Parlement politically saw themselves as the defenders of French freedom, even though they were the defenders of their own rights and privileges. And they were very good at creating the myth to the common people that we are protecting you, when all they were doing was protecting themselves. And they could tell the crown no, and send the edict back, what was called a remonstrance. That remonstrance could have an outline that says, this is the problem part. Like, this isn't explained well enough. The jurisdiction of what you're creating doesn't have enough detail. They can send it back and say, you can't. We will not register this because it is not clear enough or it's illegal, etc. And the king could trump it. And we'll get into how he could trump it next week. But it's important to realize that there's a building rub between these parlements and the crown over time. Louis XIV largely brought the Parlement to heel, got them to do what he wanted. Louis XV didn't, and Louis XVI went to war with them, like political war. So we'll get into the political war next week as well. But before we do all that, we're going to go back to talking about the lines, lines, everywhere are lines. Because believe it or not, tax structure and all of this matters. The biggest source of the financial crisis that would eventually hit the Ancien Regime is the tax structure. You know what? We're going to talk about the tax structure when we come back from BRB, because this is a major sub-point of this section. French Enlightenment won't take that long. We are at an hour and 46 minutes, and that's a lot of time to listen to this, and this is a major pivot in what we're talking about. So as we turn into the tax structure, keep the lines, lines, everywhere is lines concept in your head. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about how the tax structure was busted. We'll likely swing into the Enlightenment, and that'll be, that'll be episode one. But hopefully you guys are still awake and having fun and listening and learning. If you have questions, you've been asking them here and there, but ask some more. And there'll be a test at the end, and we'll go from there. So stand up, walk around, get a drink. I'll be right back. Excellent! Yeah. Yeah. We're
the Lord. F*** yourself. Let's rock! Doc's correct. This has been something that everyone has wanted me to start doing for over two years, and I'm happy to see as many people as are here. It's really encouraging. My fear was that I would bore the crap out of you by the time we got to this point. Um, yes, Durf, they will be in YouTube, and this is how I plan to break it down. Uh, there will be a playlist for the French Revolution. That will be the only playlist for now. When we pivot to the Napoleonic era, which is about the time of the uh, coup of uh, Brumaire, which is 17. I think um, we'll create a new playlist. There will be a master playlist that contains every episode in order from 1.1 to probably 8. Dot something. And then there will be playlists per era. So if you just want to focus on one era, you can go back and watch that era. Not taking a test. Test will be fine as far as free stream list cards, up to you. But I will put uh, the chat on stream so you guys can see me noticing the. Um, hopefully, you're having fun, which is the important part here. Knowledge is fun, believe it or not. We all hated it when we were younger and uh, got older, and learning how the world is built is um, really fun. So thank you, Herc, for saying that uh, you love the way this is being presented and the information. I'm hoping, I'm trying to do this in a way that is articulate and drives the minutia of what all of this is to you as an audience in a way that is understandable because completely, completely jumbled stuff. It's really hard to keep track of things. I'll get you after that. Um, so card packs are on. Stream loose cards are, will be off forever for this. I do not want them on the stream. I want you guys to be able to see what we're talking about, see chat, not have that be obscured. But um, yeah, hopefully that you guys are getting the gist of what I'm breaking down. Um, 13 books went into episode one, and they will play into the further episodes as well. Uh, but 13 books went into informing me on this. And the key thing about history, and I said this at the outset, is that... Every historical chronicle is biased by its author. There is almost always a political motivation behind the, the writings of whomever wrote what. So that is why reading more than one thing is important. What I am trying to do with this is present to you that amalgamated view. The more objective I can piece together, these things are true as multiple people who have a different, differing motivations all said the same thing. So... That's the whole idea. So if you're interested in the sources, exclamation point sources, it's a living Google Doc. Uh, as we move through the series, I will embolden the books I add that become new source material for whatever we're talking about at each particular point. Um, so far, I think that this is going to stay the same. But yeah, I am also making book recommendations. So uh, the first book I recommended was obviously uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, The Ancien Regime and the French Revolution. It is the foundational text of the 19th century on the matter. Uh, but if you don't like reading the non-fiction historical type thing. Um, there is a book called A Place of Greater Safety. It is a fictionalized historical novel that will get into people you are going to care about in a few episodes. Uh, Maximilien Robespierre, Georges Danton, uh, Camille Desmoulins, people who are really going to be in charge of things as we roll into the early 1790s. So if you don't like reading history, but you do want to have a frame of reference, a Place of Greater Safety is an outstanding book to read simply because it will put names and events in your head so that when I start talking about them, you'll go, oh, yeah, and it'll make things a little bit easier for you. Um, I get nothing, by the way, for recommending any book. I take no, no Amazon commission at all. I, don't, I would prefer you buy it from a local bookstore. Um, so if you're interested in it, yeah, don't be like the Cree Greed. <laughs> The joke there being I had a DD and d character in Poe's game once that was named the Krieg who didn't read. Not that he couldn't read, he just wouldn't. Okay. Tax structure as my book flipped over one page and I need to move my bookmark because we are into the last two pages of my notes for today. Je vais vous say un triomphe terrible. On... Yes, when you press the buttons, they do spell Napoleon. Next time you look, you follow it along. It does spell out Napoleon on the touchpad. Okay, so we talked about lines, lines. Everywhere is lines, and I think that's a great analogy for us to keep that concept in our head. Thank you very much, Dustin, for saying it. Um, 
Lines, lines, everywhere is lines from the different provincial, local, generalite, law of common and code law, and then the ecclesiastical church map that also had its own laws. All of that matters because we're going to talk about taxes, tax structure, and how the crown managed its money. So if we go back to Louis XIV, we talk about how much money he spent. Spent money lavishly like it was a bottomless pit of money. Station! 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 Station. So he built Versailles. He had to revert resort to venal offices to raise money because he didn't want to raise taxes because he didn't want to call the estates general because calling the estates general is the only way to get new taxes added to the way the government works. And by calling the estates general, the king and someone like Louis XIV certainly didn't want to lose control by granting authority and power to an external body. So the tie. The tie is a land tax. A tax on land. So based on land ownership, you are taxed a certain amount of money for owning that land, right? We have the same basic concepts like you know, school district tax, property taxes, that type of thing. That all exists today, right? We have a land tax to a degree, right? So there's a land tax, except for the fact that, guess what? The nobility and the clergy, the church, first and second estate largely was exempt from the tie. So if you go back and look at how much land was owned by the church and how much land was owned by the second estate, it's about 43% of the land in France. 43% of the land in your kingdom is non-taxable. We talk about things like nonprofits who aren't really nonprofits running as a nonprofit so they can not have to pay local, you know, local property taxes and things like that. And it's a big deal when that's not that much. 43% of the land in France was not taxable and that's why people wanted to become nobles that's why all of these privileges all of these lines persisted because everyone was benefiting from their specific privileges that they got based on what generation they were in or what province they were in or what local government they were in or what diocese or archbishopric they were in and no one wanted to give up the fact that they didn't have to pay a tax also it's important to note that not paying a tax was a Look at how special I am. I don't have to pay taxes because I'm a noble. It was a thing that showed status. It showed how an individual was special in this era, and people did not want to give it up. So 43% of the land owned by nobles and the church could not be taxed by the crown for revenue. And then there was the capitation tax. There was a head tax on households. So how many people lived in your house? You paid a certain amount of money in taxes. Guess what? You could buy an exemption. Guess who could afford an exemption? Nobles, really rich people in the first estate, archbishops, bishops, they could all afford to pay for an exemption, which is going to be less than the amount of money it cost them to pay a head tax on the massive number of servants that they had. So instead of getting the true value of all the heads in that household, the crown allowed them to purchase an exemption, an exemption which would last longer than the annual rate of the capitation tax, so they lost money long-term by granting the privilege to solve an immediate need. Money greases many wheels indeed. And then there is the vatium. The vatium is not a tax that lives in perpetuity. You're going to hear the vatium. You want to circle this one, draw a line around it, say this one's important for next week. The VATM is a 120th wealth tax. 5% of how much you're worth gets taxed and brought to the crown. The trick is, is that the VATM was an e that was negotiated with the Parliament, was registered with, you know, it had to be negotiated with the Parliament and the nobility to basically say, are you guys ready to pay 5% of how much you owe because the crown needs it? It was for a finite period of time and it would expire. So there's a period of time where these richer groups would pay 5% of their wealth into the crown, and then it would expire. Gilly, may I make a suggestion in the middle of your presentation, even though it's going to be a pain in the ass? Sure, fire. I don't know how these French words should be spelled. V-A-T-I-E-M, two words. And it's really not important to know how they're spelled, um, knowing what they are, and if you want to... Spell them phonetically, just so that as we go along, you understand what's being said. That Remember works. to clonk that follow -E button. T-I-E-M. Vatiem. But it was, this was a, a tax that expired, right? We would pass it in 17... 
1779, I think, and it would expire in 1786. One of them would, but it was always a political. You would you would spend political capital as a king and as the as the ministry to get a vatiem, because you had to negotiate with that. You had to go to the, the aristocracy. They say we really like to tax five percent of your wealth. Is that okay? And they're like, well. But the Vatiem became this revolving mechanism of solving shortfalls in the budget. But every time you had to go do it as the crown, you ended up spending political capital. It was never a open-ended, open-valued tax. But the Vatiem is extremely important as we get into next week. We start talking about how the controllers general in France tried to use it in order to get themselves out of real trouble. The fourth place revenue comes from is from the church. The Catholic Church gave a free gift to the crown because, you know, they weren't paying taxes on their land. It occurred every 10 years. It was expected by both the church and the crown that it would happen. And the church also took out loans for the crown because the church's credit rating was better. The church would pass the principle of the value of the loan to the crown and the church would pay the interest. So they were picking up some of the tab but still wasn't worth the value of their land, they still weren't paying their fair share. The the point is, is the idea that the the church and the aristocracy were not paying anything is false. Were they paying fair value of what they had? Absolutely not. And then the church had a claim to a 10% forced tithe on all people. It was supposed to support local parishes, but it generally didn't. It generally made the opulent residences and lifestyles of the bishops and archbishops more opulent and more lavish. Um, The tithe, which is different from the tie, which is the land tax that 43% of the land was exempt to, the tithe corresponds to exactly what you may be used to if you come from a Christian church background. 10% tithe to the church, except it's a voluntary thing. Thank you very much, Doc. It's a voluntary thing in modern society, whereas the French Catholic Church could force you to pay it even if you were a protestant so then we roll into where the disproportionate taxes on the third estate roll in because if you think it's not fair yet it's about to get really unfair we're talking about exemptions for nobility exemptions for clergy and that so far but the lower classes were all beholden to these taxes as well as they applied you owned land, you had to pay pay the tie. You were rich enough, you paid into the VATM. Yeah, a compulsory tithe is not a tithe, it's a tax. Church tax. So we start talking about how the bourgeoisie, the bourgeoisie, which is not noble, right? They are the third estate. They are the upper crust of the third estate, but they are not noble. They are where a high a more highly over time more of the wealth of France becomes concentrated in the bourgeoisie, the lawyers, doctors, lettered men, the the, the merchants. Those people start holding more and more of the value of the economy in their personal finances. Bankers are also um, within the third estate, the bourgeoisie. So what they have to deal with is an excise tax on commodities. So if you're not familiar with what an excise tax is, when you go buy gas, there's an excise tax on your gas. You're paying a state-levied fee for the use of a commodity. That is an excise tax. There are excise taxes on everything. Playing cards, paper, tobacco, most luxury food products in general, clothing, anything that kind of was above the minimum of bread and water probably had an excise tax on it. Yep. But the, the excise taxes were individualized, and guess what? Excise taxes were largely governed by which province you lived in, which generalité you lived in, which local government was responsible for your area, which court system governed your area, and which diocese covered your area. The excise taxes were very specifically regionalized based on where an individual was purchasing, not where they were from. The different regions would benefit because their excise taxes were lower than other regions. Then you have internal customs duties. So those of you who don't know what a customs duty is, is when you cross a border, you pay a fee for transporting your goods. Um, Those of you who travel internationally know that there's a duty-free store when you come back through, which is free from paying 
customs duties. So imagine you had a system with a bunch of different lines drawn on it that didn't care about who drew the other lines at different points in time. Imagine there was a customs duty for crossing every single one of those lines. It was possible that you could cross 12 checkpoints or customs duties to get something from Grenoble to Paris. 12 different custom taxes to move a product from the southeastern portion of France to the capital. We're going to get into that problem that Dr. Death just talked about in a minute. What if I can't go across those lines and buy? We'll talk about that in a minute. Then you have the Gobel. G-O-B-E-L, the Gobel, which was a salt tax, a specific excise tax for salt. It forced people to buy salt based on where they lived at a set price, even if, as Doc just said, province once province over has it cheaper. It varied wildly based on where the individual salt was being purchased. And guess what? The Gobel, the clergy, and the nobility were exempt from it. So this tax for buying salt only applied basically to the third estate. And then you had the fact that the crown and nobility could force you to pay in labor, which is called the corvée, C-O-R-V-E-E, -E, corvée. It's an obligation to work or hand over equipment for government to use, government or nobility to use. You also had feudal obligations that still existed in these areas where, because of where you lived, you had to pay tributes to a specific noble. You had to pay rents for living on their land. You had to use their specific mills or wineries or vineyards to help produce your raw product into its final form because they said so, because they still held a feudal hold over you. So all these people who live in all these different varying regions that are, have all these different lines applied to them also had independently governed they were independently governed by specific nobles who still held them accountable to feudal law as well saying i need your oxen to fund a state project which just had or to work on a state project which happens to build a road to my front door now we're starting to talk about the things that may cause some of these people especially out in the rural areas to pick up and sharpen their pitchfork and then we will talk about tax farming we live in a world where there are federal agencies that receive a piece of paper from you and debit an account or give you money back, and the system is largely automated, unless you're an independent contractor, self-employed, which gets a little bit more difficult. But generally speaking, taxation and collection of those taxes in the modern world is at least understandable. Not what you're taxed for, but the collection of those taxes. The way tax collection worked, and this goes back to like Roman times. The way tax collection worked in the world at this time is through a system called tax farming, where a company would bid a certain amount to the crown and say, I can collect this much taxes. They would go collect that amount, give it back to the crown, and then anything they got extra was their profit. So it was basically saying, name that tune on how much of all of this system we've just talked about an individual company or group thinks they can actually go get. This makes me think of Crusader Kings. Don't want nobles to have land that was from another monarch because I won't get their full monies and taxes. To a degree. I'm really starting to see why I say people say, yeah, man, how whack. So what would happen is tax farming, right? Groups of individuals would fan out into the countryside when it was tax collection time, which happened sometimes four times a year, sometimes twice a year. And they would knock on doors and say, time to pay your Gobel tax, time to pay your tie, time to pay your capitation tax, time to pay the VATM. And they'd collect that money. and They'd take that back to the crown. Sometimes they wouldn't give you a receipt. They'd come back two weeks later and say, time to pay your capitation tax. And you'd say, I already paid my capitation tax. And they'd say, show us the proof. And they'd take it again. That's how tax farmers made their money, by double and triple collecting on taxes sometimes. There's only so much you can ask the common people to shoulder the burdens of country's costs without spreading the pain. Yep, and that's actually not what causes the uh, Re French Revolution, believe it or not. <laughs> it was what causes the, the Great Terror, but it's not what causes, or the portion of the reason it causes the Great Terror. But the idea being here that all of these things pay into the notion that this regime was busted, right? You have this tax system. have a structure that has no rhyme or reason financially or judicially 
that makes people play by the same rules. And then based on if who you are and where you were born, you may have no way out of any of it, right? I was born in Grenoble. I was born in Delphine, but not in Grenoble. And we have different sets of rules based on the 30 kilometers that exist between where you were born and where I was born because I'm subject to feudal rule because of this aristocrat, but your aristocrat has let you go out of feudal rule. It gets crazy. And then you start talking about, well, I want to move my grain to this province. Well, there are 17 tax, there are 17 customs duties because of the ecclesiastical, the legal, the governmental, the generalite, and the provincial lines that exist between all of them. So the fact that all of this existed was both hard on the individuals who were subject to the tax. The exemptions made it extremely difficult for the crown to make money off of the taxes because the people who had lots of money weren't paying all that much of it. And just the haphazard fractured, like imagine you had a, a system where there was a nice pane of glass and someone just dropped a rock on it and then just pushed the pieces of glass together and said, figure it out. That's kind of what the legal and economic system that's involved here is. You're still competing with the guild system as well, which is an anachronism to the way the world is evolving to a free trade position in the 1800s. The idea here being that you'd want to abolish all those internal tax duties. I'm actually talking from memory now. I don't even know if we're getting as we're at the end of tonight's notes, but you're, you're talking about working for a system where these internal customs barriers should be wiped away, right? You would want free trade internally and some level of tariffs protecting, protecting your borders. That's what we do today. We don't, we don't have interstate tax for transporting goods from where they're made in Iowa to where they're delivered to a Walmart in Pennsylvania. That doesn't exist. There are some levels of taxes with respect to riding on a highway but the goods themselves are not taxed for simply being moving from one point to another inside the country. But if you want to bring steel in, there is a small, well, there's a big tariff on it right now, but there's generally a small tariff on it because your country can make it with cheaper labor than we can. So we want to protect our industry. And that's why you have an external customs barrier that helps protect your internal industry. And you have to balance all that in the name of free trade, making sure everyone in the world can get what they need for a fair market price. None of the way in which France was set up in the 1780s has anything to do with that concept. It's all built around protecting individuals in their small enclaves inside of where they live in their very small piece of France. So, two hours to get through all of that. Let's start with question. That is, oh, you know what? I can't start with questions. So I didn't even cover the last piece. I didn't go to the French Enlightenment because I'm a dumb dumb. And I put notes down there, and I thought that was in my notes, and it's not. So we'll start with this. Do you have questions on the very complicated way that we have covered taxes, privileges, and estates, the history of the Bourbon dynasty? Because the, the French Enlightenment is a gear shift away from what I have been talking about so far. Nah. So all of that is confusing as mud. At least have a basic idea of what we're talking about because what we're going to talk about next is different. Going once. Yeah, it's all clear as far as how unclear they were running things. Yep. No questions, but I'm definitely going to be watching and rewatching this. That's why it's being recorded. Okay. The last point. And this, was, this will be handled pretty quickly. The French Enlightenment. So the Enlightenment began under King Louis XV, right? And it was the promotion, and I have this written down in a very specific way, the promotion of a theory of knowledge rooted in rational thought, evidence, and critical thinking instead of tradition and superstition. And that's where I have to draw a very specific line here. I am not going to attack religion as if it's bad. Um, I'm not, I, I do not wish to speak about religion as if it is a problem, but I will speak about it from the obje objective position that is seen as superstitious by the Enlightenment, okay? So, I, am, I personally hold to the belief that you believe what you believe and what works for you. I don't have a problem with that. But it's important for me to clarify the statement because the Enlightenment views religion as superstition. So, I am not saying your religion is superstition. I am saying that within the context of discussing the Enlightenment, the, those Enlightenment thinkers do believe that. With that said, I'm going to dive in. The scientific revolution, which helped us discover planets and all kinds of other amazing things like gravity, and that's rooted in the Enlightenment era thinking 
uh, is also incorporated in the French Enlightenment. So what happens is a class of intellectuals develops early in the 18th century. And My lord! Hmm? Yeah, pretty much. I don't want anyone to get pissed and say, oh, and blah, 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 you said this about religion. No, Voltaire said this about religion. Um, so it develops this, this cabal, this group of, of intellectual thinkers who start to question things. They want to examine things. They want to evaluate things. They want to apply logic and reason and evidentiary fact-finding, very much how I think, to everything. Everything. And that's where the scientific revolution comes in, but it also spurs this political revolution, this, pol this, this political thinking revolution called the French Enlightenment. It starts when Louis XIV uh, dies. Guess why? Because Louis XIV stamped down on everybody who said anything bad about him. And Louis XV, who wasn't really interested in being a monarch, kind of let things go. He wasn't so bad about clamping down on things in the press that were anti-Louis. So as people started to say, hey, maybe we shouldn't have an absolute monarchy, but maybe a constitutional monarchy would be better. And a constitutional monarchy is where you have an elected body of legislature that works in partnership with a monarch. Kind of like supposedly England works today, except the Queen really doesn't do much. There was an extreme interest in political reform. Reforming not only all the lines, lines everywhere is lines, but the way in which the lines were drawn. Taking away the edict power, the direct, absolute, regal will power of the crown, and making it more about what I just said. Having a legislature, whether it be a single body or bicameral, that had to debate and review bills from the king and propose laws to the king for his review. It, were, it would be like having a legislative and executive branch, except the executive branch is a monarch. That's a constitutional monarchy. There was huge interest in individual rights. So you take a system where you have all these lines, lines, lines that put people in different tiny small buckets that no one else can understand because they're in a different small bucket, and you start applying reasonable thinking to the purpose of individual rights and people start going wait a minute what the heck is going on here so you start having these thinkers start coming up with ways in which to make things better starting with the death of louis the 14th and really catching speed as we start getting into the mid to late 18th century so there was a huge increase in literacy during this time which led to the bourgeoisie becoming who they were, right? The Enlightenment led to people reading because they could afford to buy things because they were becoming richer. The, the bourgeoisie's wealth was becoming a larger and larger portion of, the, of France's economy, and they had a little bit of extra money to spend, not only on the fancy knee socks, but on the piece of paper that some other thinker wrote that made them go, hmm, that sounds like a really good idea. And so literacy explodes in France as the Enlightenment rolls out, people wanted to read what people like Voltaire and Montesquieu and Jean-Jacques Rousseau are saying. We're going to talk about all three of those people in a minute. So the big thing, and this thing is the next thing that you're going to go, hmm, I didn't know that, but it really affects my modern world, is the big thing the Enlightenment in France produced, Enlightenment in France and England produced, is this thing called the Encyclopedia. There were 28 volumes of the first Encyclopedia written between 1751 and 1772. It was an attempt to, camp to capture all philosophical and advanced knowledge. It was subject to the whims of the crown's censor authority, so it was always written under the auspice of this might be the last one. But the very first encyclopedia evolves out of the French Enlightenment. So Wikipedia, which we all use, finds its historical roots in the notion of the French Enlightenment's will to capture as much modern knowledge as they could. So we learn about why it's called the Fourth Estate for the Press. For those of you who heard that before, and you've learned about why we have Wikipedia and where it originates from, where the idea of a collection of mass knowledge curated by thinkers comes from. So the thing that the Catholic Church saw was the Catholic. Oh, sorry, the Catholic Church. The thing that the Enlightenment saw along its evolution was the Catholic Church victimizing commoners. And again, last time I'm going to say it, this is the Enlightenment thinking, not my perspective. I don't want to say if I do or do not agree with it. But Enlightenment thinkers looked at the Catholic Church and said, this group of individuals is telling these people who cannot read that there is a man in the sky who says, give me 10% of your money or you'll go to hell. And they looked at that and said, what? 
many of the bishops in the first estate were atheists, or at least deists, who didn't believe in the teaching of the church. Most of them didn't believe in God at all. They simply saw the clergy as a path forward. So, understanding that the Enlightenment believed that the Catholic Church dogmatically as an institution was taking advantage of the uneducated is a big deal. The first major thinker to really come out against the church was Voltaire. B-O-L-T-A-I-R-E, Gilly. So he got, his, he got the ball rolling, really, on the French Enlightenment in 1718, and he was a force for about 60 years. So right up until 1778, right around the time the American Revolution's in full swing and the fiscal crisis that we're going to talk about next week, so it was really hard. He was a deist, which means he believed in a higher power. He just not, did not believe in the higher power that the Catholic Church was telling him to believe in. He didn't adhere to the, Christ, the Christian dogma that stated, you know, there's a trinity and Jesus Christ was the savior of, of uh, because he solved the world of its sins by taking them upon himself and resurrected after he was crucified. He didn't adhere to that, but he did adhere to the notion that there was a governing higher authority in the universe that was undefinable. I don't know, maybe you do. Maybe you owed it. And then he favored strengthening the crown. And this is a term that's going to come up a lot. You can hear, you will hear the term enlightened monarch or enlightened despot. And I am going to use the term enlightened despot because a despot is a unilateral ruler. Um, I think monarch is a limiting term. So enlightened despotism is something that Voltaire believed very much in. I'm going to have a whole section on what that means here very shortly. On the other side is Montesquieu. M-O-N-T-E-S-Q-U-E, who in 1948 wrote the most important work of his life called The Spirit of the Laws. He favored balanced power centered in, centered in the nobility. So you have Voltaire who's saying, I want a strong central monarch. And you have Montesquieu who is saying, I want the regions to be power, a powerful check on the executive. Montesquieu would be a huge influence on those who wrote the American Constitution because it prescribed a system of checks and balances in the spirit of the laws. The spirit of the laws becomes a foundational document when the Constitution of the United States goes to be written. So you have two Enlightenment thinkers who are both hugely intelligent, Voltaire and Montesquieu, who have vastly differing, differing approaches to how they believe Government reform in the world, but in France in specific, specifically, should move forward. And the, here's a really funny thing. Montesquieu was a member of a parlement in Brittany. So he was a provincial parlement, parlement member, which means no duh. He would prefer the provinces to have a better check on the crown than Voltaire's suggestion of saying, oh, we should centralize as much power as possible in the crown itself. He believe, Montesquieu believed in the necessity of public consent. He wanted people to have a say in who represented them and what laws were passed so that edicts from the crown were not just there because he believed it was a matter of time until one bad ruler spoiled it all. Whereas those who believed in enlightened despotism were hoping and banking on the fact that there was a really, really good and strong central leader who had the best interest of the people in mind. I tend to side with Montesquieu in terms of enlightenment philosophy. But I see where, where Voltaire was coming from. So he also believed, Montesquieu, that there was a need for intermediary institutions, which is the same idea of provincial parlement feeds into central parlement, feeds into a fight with the crown about rules. But he believed in having far more granular institutions so that taxes weren't gathered by tax farmers, which you had regional tax authorities and things like that. The, the, a lot of what you understand, especially those American viewers, a lot of what you understand in the way that our structure is built is very much rooted in the, uh, the spirit of the laws written by Montesquieu because he prescribed the basic groundwork that our founding fathers picked up and ran with because we had a group of Enlightenment thinkers who were Republican. We have a group of Enlightenment thinkers and guys like Voltaire who are very monarchical. They're very rooted in the ways of old Europe, still prescribing subscribing to the idea that they believe in the notion of a monarchy, just changing it from an absolute monarchy into something else. Montesquieu also believes this, and this is critical. 
Um, there are a lot of people in the world who want to say our system is best system. You should use best system, right? Montesquieu thinks that's nuts, and I think that's nuts too. I don't think you can take a system that works in the United States or a system that works in you know in Europe and say let's go apply this to China or Australia or Malaysia or South Africa because there are too many cultural, geographical, economical differences that exist in all those different areas to simply say our system, best system, use best system. It doesn't work that way. And Montesquieu also agreed with that thinking. But a lot of wars get fought because our system, best system, you must use our system at the point of a knife or a gun barrel. And it's, it's incredible to think that, you know, these guys are writing these things down, you know, 250 years ago, and no one picked up the lesson yet. That, that's probably not the way to do things. So we'll get into our last Enlightenment thinker. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, J-O-N hyphen, J-A-C-Q-U-E-E-S space R-O-U-S-S-E-A-U for Gilly. We're going to spell it all out for Gilly every time now. He wrote in 19, I'm sorry, 19, sure he did, in 1750, Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote an essay that asked how, it was answering a question, how has the enlightened Enlightenment movement helped mankind. And he wrote this ironic essay that said, here's all the ways it hasn't. Here's all the way the Enlightenment's been terrible. Here's all the ways that the Enlightenment's bad for people. And it won first prize because everybody thought he was being funny, except Jean-Jacques Rousseau was about the most anti-Enlightenment person that you would ever find in this era in French history. I know, Gilly. Um... Jean-Jacques Rousseau was anti-enlightenment. He was anti the ideas of modernizing all these political mechanisms. That even Either way, the way that Voltaire has described them or the way that Montesquieu has described them. He believed that man was at his base good and that institutions that were placed in his path are what corrupted him. And to a degree, he's right. There are systems in place that man sees and sees loopholes in and takes advantage of. But then I would come back and say... That speaks to the fact that man is not inherently good because a good man would see that loophole and close it instead of taking advantage of it. But at the end of the day, Jean-Jacques Rousseau founds what is known as the Romantic Movement, which would be basically the Anti-Enlightened Movement. And it would take over for a time in Europe after the French Revolution ends and Napoleon comes into power. He is famous for something called the Social Contract which idealizes a political system which neutrally aligns the sovereign will of the people to the sovereign will of the people. So he comes up with this pseudo-utopian idea of a political system that is fluid and always aligns to the will of the people. Right. 250 years later, I think we can look back with experience and say that is not how it works. It's a really nice thought, and I wish people were good enough to have things work that way, but... Going back to Rousseau's most foundational piece, Mankind is Good, I would counter that. Say you should read The Prince and figure out that mankind will take advantage of every opportunity that they can get when they see it. Generally speaking, we're all guilty of it. There's simply a line at which we'll cross to say, um, I don't want to harm anybody else, and some don't care about that line. In any case, you have these thinkers, these Great thinkers. I don't agree at all with Rousseau, but he's a great thinker. He makes me think. I don't agree entirely with Voltaire, especially from the perspective of I don't believe in centralizing power in a single individual because I think that corrupts them. Uh, I agree a lot with Montesquieu. But the point is that these individuals and these pieces of work, again, the social contract by Rousseau, the, let me see, the, going back to my notes here real quick, the Spirit of the Laws by Montesquieu, and Voltaire, I don't, um, I don't have his work written down. But they're major works. When you read them, and I have read some of them, I just don't have the titles of the books committed to memory anymore. When you read them, they make you think about the way in which the world works today. And you go and say, hmm, were they right or were they wrong? Were aspects of what they thought right or wrong? And I think people, these thinkers, were all right in certain areas, and they were all wrong in certain areas. I just think some were more right and more wrong, and none of them are completely right. And that's about a compromise in, in approach to thought. But reading through what these guys thought... Remember to clonk that follow button.
of rolling to the set to the 1770s and 1780s for the bourgeoisie was making them go hmm and applying it to everyday life in france so we're going to talk about enlightened despotism and this is the last topic for today enlightened despotism is the concept that a ruler who is educated in modern ideas concerned about the subjects they governs well-being having wielded enough power to force through the reforms inquired, required by Enlightenment ideas. So the notion is that Voltaire wants an enlightened despot. He wants this smart, concerned, common-sense guy to rule, cares about his people, and subscribes to at least the basic philosophy of the Enlightenment. The problem is, Louis XVI, not that guy. At all. He's smart. He really does have the best interests of his people at, at heart. He is an Enlightenment thinker to a degree, but he most certainly does not have the force of will to power through anything that France needed. There were problems that had been bubbling and now boiling for over 100 years. And instead of looking at the problems, taking the advice of good people and saying, let's put down a plan and stick to it, no matter how painful it is to reform this lines upon lines upon lines and exemptions of 43% of the land from tax system where people can simply bind up being a judge instead of drawing up a plan, sticking to it, no matter how much resistance there was. And this is possible. This is what an enlightened despot would do. There are examples of enlightened despots who have done it contemporarily to Louis XIV. He didn't have it in him. He was, a, he was a nice guy. From everything I can read about him, he was a good-hearted man. He just simply did not have the spine to do what was necessary. The idea of the enlightened despot, for those of you who have taken a classical philosophy class, goes way back. It goes back to the, to the philosopher king in Plato's Republic. That's where the first notion of this enlightened despot arises so if you want to get some background on the concept of enlightened despotism start there i'd also read a lot of voltaire because he wants an enlightened despot but examples of enlightened despots as they are contemporary to louis the uh, 16th frederick the great of prussia prussia which was a duchy of poland eventually became its own kingdom parts of its lands were in the holy roman empire which is a whole other problem with lines upon lines upon lines but frederick the great reformed prussia militarily big time but politically, from a judicial standpoint, and economically, and made Prussia from 1740 to 1786 when he ruled kind of a something you were worried about to an instigator of the Seven Years' War and a major power in Europe. Catherine the Great of Russia from 1660, 1762 to 1796, which overlaps the revolutionary period. Again, major reformer, puts Russia on the stage as a great power. And then Joseph II of the Holy Roman Empire. From 1741 to 1790, who was the brother of Marie Antoinette. Another great enlightened despot forcibly pushes through hard reforms. And the key thing here is, if you look at a map, if you look at this map, Prussia's over here. Down here is where Austria is going to be, where the Holy Roman Empire is. And then way off on the other side in the east is Russia. But France and England's already had the revolution. They're already under a constitutional monarchy since their civil war since the civil war failed but you have france who's in this antiquated system surrounded by nations who are modernizing through the will of an enlightened despot which is why like voltaire believed in it so much because he's looking out the window and going they're doing it they're doing it they're doing it and why can't we do it it's because you have a vacillating monarch who meant while he may have the best intentions does not have the guts necessary to stand up to anyone politically and say no this has to happen because if it doesn't, we're all in big, big trouble. And the big, big trouble will hit in the 1780s when the controller general of France, John, uh, George Calon, walks in and says, we are out of money. There is not enough money in the royal treasury to keep the lights on for one more day. And leading up to that will be the conversation that we have next week. We talk about how at every step of the way everybody who had every one of these privileges said i don't want to give up mine but force them to give up theirs if that'll fix the system and nothing got done in time and france went broke
That's the end of episode 1.1 from an informational perspective. So first off, questions. Anything you guys want to ask about before I ask you some things? Nothing right now. Okay, so here's how this is going to work. I have a couple questions to see who is paying attention. And if you get it right, you're going to get a free pack of Streamloose cards because that's how you mess with me during Darkest Dungeon. Are you done with spelling questions? I done good, kid. This is the foundation. We talked about nothing in terms of actually, like, this is what leads to crisis, right? This isn't actually anything to do with the crisis. This is just what causes the crisis to be possible. The crisis will start next week, next Saturday night, 7 p.m. Uh, we will start talking about the Parlement and the individual controllers general that try to do individual things to fix things. But this was all about understanding what the heck we're going to start talking about as we tell this story next week. So... My head is exploding. I'm driving, so I won't answer. That's fine. So, let's start with... Which two aspects of the Third Estate make up the sans lot? Give me a, a reasonable definition of who makes up the sans lot. First good answer in chat, which is on the screen, is what I will take. And that person will get a free pack of cards. Rural workers is not correct. All the farmers is not correct. Unskilled workers is close. Get a little bit more specific. Nope, definitely not bankers and merchants. They were the bourgeoisie. So what does sans culotte mean? It means no fancy socks. The people without pantyhose. Common or serfs. That's pretty close, but serfs is a bad term. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, nope, farmers and merchants. Merchants were part of the bourgeoisie. So let's go back and review this then. The sans culotte were made up of urban unskilled and skilled labor so those people who act as servants those people who did day labor and worked on public works projects just because that's the work that was available to them and then the individuals who worked in trades that were not educated like being a blacksmith or being a haberdasher or a shrubberer as those in chat wanted to say earlier the haberdashers indeed the sans culotte are those people in the urban environments who look at all the other people, the lettered men, the lawyers, and the doctors, and the nobles, and they say, look at those fancy socks. I can't afford those fancy socks because I'm not one of those fancy people. I'm simply an unskilled or basically skilled laborer. So what I'm going to do here is Manny got closest. So we're going to give it to Manchu, even though he has a bajillion packs. Unless you'd like to give it away to somebody else, Manny. Give it to the next one. Okay, so the winner of the next one will get two packs based on Manny's decision. So, define for me the reason Louis the Fourteenth created venal offices. Nope, he wasn't broke. That's a short it's a short answer that is not accurate. The crown was not broke. Spending too much for something. There we go. Dr. Death got it. Help pay for the amount of money he was spending. He was spending too much. He was spending on Versailles construction. He was spending on wars. 
and he had to make up the difference that he was in what he was spending by selling offices like being a judge or being the king's secretary so it is he was spending too much and had to come up with an economic mechanism that was not a new tax in order to raise money so doc will get two packs of cards yep the idea being that louis the 14th did not want to call the estates general which is the only way to create that new tax right the Estates General was the only vehicle that could, could create taxes in France. And instead of giving them control over his absolute authority, he chose to sell offices. Okie dokie, okie dokie. How, what percentage of the land did the church own in France in 1789? Ten, and the Archie gets it. Arky, there you go. I got you. And there's your pack. 10%. 43% is the amalgamated combination of the nobility and the clergy in France in 1789. But, proves you're paying attention. How old was Louis XIII when he became king? Nope. 10 Mads gets it. It was 10, then 4, then 5, and that sequence. Or 10, yeah, 10, then 4, then 5, right? Yeah. That gets that one right. Too many Louis, indeed. Okay. No more questions about age. Let's see. Another good question we can ask. What was Marie Antoinette's original quote-unquote last name? Close, but not it. No go on Wikipedia either. Antonia. Mads gets it again. Re Antonia. Not Joanna. Okie dokie. <laughs> what was the name of the 5% wealth tax? That's it. Batiem. Number 98 got it as well. Let's see. You guys are not going to like these ones. What was it called when a commoner was forced to pay tax to his noble in labor, or equipment. I said it real fast. So I'll get it if no one gets this one. Corvée, that is correct, Sturfers. Look at the big brain on Sturf. Corvée, indeed. Nice one, Sturf. All right, one last question on the test. What was the last name of the Enlightenment thinker who believed in decentralization of powers and a balanced aristocratic approach to government? One more time. Who was the Enlightenment thinker who believed in a separation of power? There we go. Number 98 who probably doesn't have a freaking Streamlabs uh, account. We're going to find out. Number nine. Not Kevin. Nope, you're not in there. You want to give those cards to anybody in particular, or would you like me to package them up and ask one more question that you're not allowed to answer? Because you don't have a Streamlabs account. Speaking of, if, you do, if you'd like a free pack of cards and haven't gotten it yet tonight, uh, go get one. Kevin's are in my pocket. Alrighty, alrighty, alrighty. 
<laughs> what was the name of the ridiculously stupid salt tax? That'll be my last question. Go Bell. That is correct. Intent Rocket 9. Who's going to get two packs thanks to number 98? Days. Those are all sent. So. That brings us to the end of episode one of Heavy Metal History. Nah, uh, spelling doesn't matter because it's French and who the hell knows how to spell it. We're, we're all forgetting the accent, the accents on the E's anyway. So, feedback. You guys have asked for this for over two years and this is the first episode in the books. Is that the ones in the clergy and the nobles didn't have pay? My Lord, it's one of them, yes. So, we're going to roll out of here in a few minutes, but I wanted to talk and make sure that this is what you guys wanted. That this is the approach to history you guys were looking for. It's not a, definitely not a stream to listen to and you're multitasking, indeed. Um, it'll become less dense as we move forward. Um, episode 2 starts in a week, 7 p.m. next Saturday. If you have not followed, you, there's a lot of lurkers in here, and I'm cool with that. But if you want to be notified when we go live, uh, drop the follow. Saturday next week, we get into the resistance to reform, the absolute opposition to the things that would save the French regime, and we will roll in with a lot of information, um, or nap during for Erky. But uh, give me feedback in the uh, the Mission Control channel. I am seriously looking to understand if you guys want this. You want it to be less dense and more pulled back. Um, I like this level of detail. I could go deeper if you want, which would take us longer. But on this format, this format that I've done this episode on, um, we are going to take about 15 episodes to finish the French Revolution, at which point we'll take a small break and we'll pivot into Napoleon. Um, there will be some history of heavy metal, or there will be some heavy metal at points. There's just not a great song that covers the French Revolution until we get to Napoleon. There is not a single heavy metal song that talks about anything that has to do with what we're talking about right now. So for those of you that can't make it, this was the foundational episode. Picking up on what happens from here on out is more story driven. Uh, there will be VODs on YouTube. I'm not asking for it, but if you guys want to go to the YouTube channel and pick it up, that's where it's at. There will be a distinct playlist for this series as we move forward, and we will go from there. So again, feedback as we roll in. Um, feedback as we roll out of here, if you wouldn't mind, to let me know where I could do better, where things were kind of confusing, maybe it was too depth, too in depth. I just want to make sure that you guys get what you were looking for out of this because this was a community driven. We want this. We want to have this program done by me, and I want to make sure that you guys get what you want out of it. We'll save all of this to the archives to upgrade right next to all the hen porn. I appreciate it, Poe. All right, I'm catching uh, a couple DMs real quick. Right. That is a very nice DM from the person who sent it. I really appreciate the fact that they said I presented this in a way that was easy to understand. Um, this is work. So, like, the OCW level work, except I enjoy this a whole lot better. Like, I can reread these books forever. So, um, I liked the work that had to be done to get to this episode. I'm already ready for 1.2, and I will work on 1.3 beginning on Monday. So, um, I don't have anybody to raid. But what I wanted to say was I really appreciate everyone being here. Um, there's a ton of people in here, and this has been really cool to see everybody turn out. I was really apprehensive about doing history from the standpoint that who would want to watch it. Any additional number maps and diagrams to help illustrate the concepts of people is always helpful. Um, the maps will come. I have a good map of Paris as we start talking about events in Paris. Uh, up until that, when we get rolling, once the... Once the estates get called, and they're going to get called, um, the maps will be, uh, will be flowing because you're going to need to know where, where people are moving and where battles are happening eventually. That'll happen. This was more nebulous. This is more conceptual. And it's more about getting, again, the foundation of what was broken and why in your head. My lord. Uh-huh. Thank you for spending two and a half years preparing for this. 
Uh, it was. I did read a lot of books. I did listen to a lot of things, and it, I, I have been preparing for the French Revolution for over probably over a year and a half. Um, and thanks to everyone who spread the word. Dustin, Gilly, um, I know Rocket did, uh, CF, Diggity, they all, you guys did an amazing job just spreading the word and letting people know this was happening. So without anything else, without anything else to say, I'll find us someone to raid and roll us out of here right after someone's done dialing the pad. Put them in the Iron Maiden. Iron Maiden? Excellent! All right, we're out of here. So I'll get someone queued up, but the outro is a little long as I'm going to talk through it. You guys are amazing. Thank you for being here. It is time. Their separation is imminent. We're going to go say hi to Mr. Will Deal because he was hanging out with Surfers last night. And go see what he's all about. He gave me a follow earlier today, so we're going to go raid him. Give him some Outlaws love. Surfers recommended him. So we're going to go hang out with Mr. Wheel Deal. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. I'll see you again next week on Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time for Episode 1.2 and Darkest Dungeon is coming Wednesday at 7 p.m. for whatever episode number we're on. Be excellent to each other. You guys have a great night. Party on, dude. And I really, really appreciate you all being here. <laughs>